Okay, I apologize for starting the meeting a little late. And uh, at this point, would the secretary please call the roll? Sure. Director Anderson? Director Buchanan? Here. Director Colson? Here. Director DeWitt? Here. Director Lewis? Director Traiani? Director McGallis? Here. We have a quorum of four present with three absent. If the record would also show that, Directors Frega, Hobson, Director Ross by phone, and Chairman Dillard are also present. Thank you. The purpose of today's meeting is to hear the presentations of the 2015 budget from CTA, Metro, and PACE. And I think it's important to, for us to understand as a committee, uh, we're not here today to take action or, or make a decision. We're here to get uh, input from the service boards, uh, to hear questions they may have, and for us to ask questions that certainly we have concerning their budgets. Uh, with that be, I know you have a, a, an opening comment mm -hmm. you want to make. So good morning, Mr. Chairman and Mr. Chairman and uh, members of the Finance Committee. Um, I wanted to start off, first of all, by just a little recap of our business plan calendar. As you know, in May, we adopted the business plan call, which lays out detailed steps and information requirements and documents that the service boards uh, must submit. And then um, we were fortunate, as you know, to uh, pass the funding amounts um, in September. So that laid the groundwork, a very collaborative process on uh, funding allocations. Uh, for the service boards. We have been through the months of October and November uh, conducting our public hearings uh, throughout the region. Only Kane County is left and we'll be doing that uh, next week uh, where we've been presenting our budget, uh, comp uh, consolidated summary of the service board budgets and certainly opening it up for public comment and input. Uh, in November, um, we uh, received uh, the service board's budgets. For the most part, again, very comprehensive, very thorough. We continue to work with the service boards when we need clarification on an issue or additional information. We actually, our, our budget group does a very thorough review, a checklist of sorts that uh, reviews every one of the items and what is still missing. Uh, so we continue to work with them, but it's a snapshot in time, and as, as time goes on, we continue to get additional information. So today you're here to, uh, you're here to hear from the service boards, um, the CFOs, and, um, and uh, from PACE, um, uh, their executive director is here as well. And um, it'll be an opportunity if you have any questions uh, on their budgets. Uh, you also received um, a summary you know, information. We have received their full budgets as well. And again, we continue to work on them. You will not be voting on anything here. Um, that will happen um, at the last uh, step of our business plan calendar, which is December 17th, and that's the actual budget adoption, at which time you will have a full ordinance, uh, the budgets, all the schedules, and, and the full detail. So today they're here to talk about their capital programs, their budget programs, and, and some additional uh, information. So I just wanted to share with you uh, a quick little summary of uh, some main points that I've been highlighting at the committee of the whole um, various throughout the counties. So in 2015, you know, the budgets call for stability in service levels accompanied by modest ridership growth of 0.5%. So the region continues on a path of economic recovery. Uh, total annual expenditures for public transportation in northeastern Illinois are projected at $4.2 billion for 2015. And this includes $2.9 billion in operating expenses and nearly $1.3 billion in capital investments. So the consolidated regional budget of $2.9 billion in expenses is balanced by revenues of $2.9 billion. So you have balanced budgets before you. Our revenues consist of public funding of $1.8 billion and operating revenue of $1.1 billion. Operating revenue includes fares and other service board revenues such as concessions and advertising. Operating revenue is, in, is projected to increase by 2.5% related primarily to Metro's uh, fare increase. Regional funds from sales tax, the State Public Transportation Fund, or PTF, and the Real Estate Transfer Tax are projected to total $1.76 billion for 2015, an increase of 4.4%, or $74.2 million, from the 2014 year-end estimate. As a point of reference, uh, last year RTA sales tax receipts from the six-county region totaled $1.07 billion. Um, so, you know, in general, sales tax and fair revenues a comp uh, comprise about 80% of the region's operating budget, so about 40% each. So it's just so you have a feel for 
what that looks like. You also have before you a document that we've been handing out. It's a four-pager at the uh, various county meetings and at our public hearings uh, that summarize, uh, summarizes the budget information. But um, with no further ado, I'm going to ask uh, Metrid actually to come forth. And oh, one last one last point. Um, I, I want to acknowledge um, all three CFOs, uh, Terry and 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 Ron and 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 Tom, uh, who worked very very collaboratively and. And closely, I know we kind of did that at the prior meeting, but actually Ron wasn't here uh, at that time. But uh, I really appreciate their hard work and, and efforts in uh, building consensus and, and, and really, um, you know, putting together a, a, a deal and a compromise that we could all work with to pass um, the funding marks on a unanimous vote, one vote. Um, so with no further ado, let me have uh, Tom Farmer come up here who will be doing the Metro presentation. Thank you. Good morning, Tom. Well, good morning. Um, <clears throat> thank you very much for the opportunity to speak with you here today. Um, I am Tom Farmer, the Chief Financial Officer of Metra, and Mr. Orsino, our Executive Director, sends his regrets that he had a an engagement out of town that had been scheduled for quite some time and he was unable to attend. I have also with me uh, Lynette Severella, our Director of Strategic Capital Planning, and James Micas, who is our Director of Budget, and uh, they're here just to uh, help out in case I need any help answering any questions. So today I would like to tell you a little bit about Metra. I'd like to help you understand what a wonderful and unique operation Metra is and what it really takes to run it. So how do I click it? Oh, no, that's okay. Thank you. So, um, <clears throat> about Metra. So today I'd like to tell you some facts about Metra. Metra operates over 750 trains a day, and we serve about 300,000 riders on 11 lines in a six-county area. We directly serve 116 communities with 241 stations across the six-county region. 76 of those stations are in Chicago. Our trains are run on tracks owned by the freights, and they in turn run trains owned on, on tracks that we own. This is one of the longest running and most successful public-private partnerships there is anywhere. If you look at the Metro passenger operations, this is a little bit of a snapshot of our operations, just so you can see the complexity that we deal with. So on the Milwaukee North and West, the Rock Island and the Metro Electric, we actually own the railroad and we operate it with our own employees. On the North Central Line, the Heritage Corridor and the Southwest Service, we operate trains that we own with our employees, but we run on somebody else's track and we pay them various trackage fees. And finally, we have four lines, three Union Pacific Lines and one Burlington or BNSF Railway line where they operate the railroad, they run the railroad, we own the rolling stock, but it's their people and we contract with them to run it. No other commuter railroad has such a complex interface with the freight railroads. As I told you before, that we run 753 trains on an average day and there are 600 freight trains on an average day. So for a three hour period, twice each weekday, during the rushes, the freight system in the city of Chicago comes to, and the region, comes to a virtual halt so that our trains can run around the tracks. So there's an immense amount of cooperation and coordination that has to happen with the freight, ra freight railroads each and every day so that our trains can bring our passengers to their destinations on time. So getting into the budget itself, first some high-level discussion. We have a balanced budget per the RTA Act requirements. We meet the recovered require, recovery ratio. Our operating spending is $753.1 million. We contemplate no permanent changes in service levels. We have state of good repair as a very key part of our capital budget, and our capital program for 2015 is $328.9 million. I would like to discuss fares for a moment. What you have here is a chart which shows three things. The solid line at the bottom of the chart is Metro fares over a roughly 30-year period. 
the dotted red line is the average pier fare. And this happens to be for a zone e ticket, but you know, different ways you crunch the numbers, it all comes out looking about the same. And the line, the green line with the small dots is the consumer price index. So what you see is that over time our fares have not kept pace either with the consumer price index nor with the pure railroads. And that is starting to show up in the fact that we are seeing a capital shortfall because we scrimped and saved for many years and that is catching up. So a key part of our budget proposal for 2015 is an overall fare increase of 10.8%. As a part of that, we will take the 10 ride ticket and discount it to the price of nine fares. The weekend pass price is increasing from $7 to $8. Monthly, ticket, monthly tickets are now valid until noon on the first weekday of the next month. And the one-way ticket is now valid for 90 days instead of 14. In terms of performance, if you look at uh, Metro's performance, I refer to some of the studies done by the RTA, and they put out a lot of good work, by the way, uh, different studies and different analyses. The uh, RTA's 2012 subregional peer report said we were better than average in operating cost per passenger mile. We were best among the peer agencies. There are six agencies that are looked at, and among the peers in terms of operating cost per mile, we were the best, 37 cents versus a 47 cents average. If you look at miles between ma major mechanical failures, we had 664 miles between failures versus a peer average of 505, despite the fact that our fleet average is almost 30 years old and the average is 19. So even with an older fleet, we're doing well with it, and we're very proud of that. So next I want to take you to the operating budget itself. Our operating budget, as I told you, is $753.1 million dollars. This is the breakdown. I won't uh, dwell on it in any great detail because it's already part of our budget submissions to the RTA. And I wanted to also show you that we have a complete package which is balanced in terms of the sources and uses. Uh, the sources are $763.1 million. The two main sources we have are our fare box revenue and the sales tax revenue which comes to us. And when I say sales taxes, I also include PTF in there and the operating uses is almost all operating expense with a little bit going to Fairbox Capital. So we are engaging on several initiatives to make our system better and more user friendly. Key among those is our mobile ticketing initiative. So why did we decide to go with mobile ticketing? Well mobile ticketing is something that's very customer focused. The customers will be able to see, touch, and feel it. It offers new payment options for them, which are much more convenient. We're able to use contactless credit cards or other credit cards. People will be able to use these cards on the train or at the station or wherever else they happen to be at what such time as they choose to make a ticket purchase. You have lower costs compared to the alternatives. You know, people have said, why don't you use System X? Uh, different systems are in place in different cities. Well. We have 241 stations. Each of them has a pretty good sized platform. If we had to fence and gate all those platforms, it would be very difficult. The other thing is that when you look at one of our trains, if it's full, you're talking about maybe 11, 1,200 people on it, something like that. If we had some kind of a gating system where people had to go through that coming on and coming off, we'd delay things quite a bit. As it is when the door, when the train pulls into the station and the doors fling open, you know, 1,100 people pouring out, that's quite a rush. So we looked at this and we decided that mobile ticketing, which really relies on visual validation inside the train cars, was the way to go. If you look at the other commuter rail agencies, our peer agencies, they are really headed the same way. So independently, we have all largely gotten to the same place. There are a couple of agencies that are trying different things. We're all anxiously watching that, but the majority of them are, seem to be headed down the road that mobile ticketing is the way to go. This is a picture of one of the design concepts. So what you have is a picture of a cell phone and a picture of what one of the tickets might look like. So this is a monthly pass, and it would have various security features built into it to prevent counterfeiting. You would have the picture of the Chicago skyline that you see there or whatever ha pattern happened to be up that day would be moving. 
it would have different colors. It would have features where if you wanted to test it and you tap the screen, the colors would change. You also have a code in the lower right-hand corner that just happens to say QR, but it's something that changes based on time and date, and that's according to a prearranged sequence so that we would know what that is, but somebody could never anticipate that up front. So there are several security features built in to make sure that nothing untoward would happen. If you look at the mobile ticketing agreement which we have developed, uh, the agreement covers the development of the application. There is a hosted service, so we will not be hosting the service ourselves. That will be done elsewhere. Uh, Metra could terminate for convenience if for some reason it didn't go well, but we don't anticipate being that, that being a problem. So what are Metra's costs? We will have costs to develop it. We will have annual hosting fees. We will have credit card processing fees, and we will have a commission. The other thing that we are doing is we are doing point of sale upgrades. As you know, we have legislation that asks us to that requires us to be able to re, to accept contactless credit cards and that sort of thing. So the contactless card readers are being installed as we speak. Uh, many of them are up and running already, and the necessary system upgrades have also occurred. So this it was a little more difficult than you might think. You know, you go up to the sales window and you see this little box and you say, oh, well, we ought to be able to change that out in five minutes. No, it's not quite that easy because there was a whole lot of things that had to happen in our foundation Oracle accounting system in order to enable that change to happen. But it's happening. They've been t tested, so it's working successfully, so we're very happy with that. Next thing I'd like to discuss is financial stability. We need $9.9 .9 billion over the next decade to main achieve and maintain a state of good repair. About a quarter of this is projected to be available from our traditional sending sources. And, you know, to improve transit in the region, we'll need your help to solve this. Uh, slicing the pie differently is not going to help. We're not better off if one of the other agencies is starved. And although you will see that we are going to, we are taking some steps in terms of fare increases, to contribute to our capital program, we will never get the whole way there with fare increases. Something else is going to have to happen. So this is a quick look at our capital program. For the year 2015, we've programmed $328.9 million. And for the total plan period, we've programmed just about a billion and a quarter dollars. In the ICE program, we have seven different projects which we are going to be working on. There's the mobile application, just discussed. Green vehicles, mainly uh, hybrid vehicles, that sort of thing, to try and improve our footprint as well as come up with things that might have better wear patterns. Automated field IT systems to help us gather better, gather better data in the field with our engineering and other personnel. Special event services, this would be running other trains downtown for different events which we more, might not normally cover. And, you know, that actually has a couple of purposes. One of them is just to obviously provide transportation to and from the event. But the other thing is we hope to entice riders who might not normally use our service to see what a great service we have and hopefully convert some of them into regular riders. Passenger information at stations, this would be enhanced information for passengers in terms of when trains would be arriving, where the trains are, that sort of thing. And hopefully we can sell a little bit of advertising time on these screens also and generate some revenue. Metro crew calling is something where we have a whole lot of requirements around hours of service for various federal safety reasons, and this would be helping us create a new system which would help us track this more efficiently as well as do our reporting more efficiently. The final thing is enhancements on the Rock Island, and what that is is another service enhancement where we are going to carry out a weekend experiment where we would have, um, I'll call it a limited express loop between certain points to improve the weekend service and once again try to entice other riders to coming onto our line. Because, you know, one of the things that has been discussed many times in this venue as well as our old board is that we have a lot of capacity that is not fully used, and so we're trying very hard to entice people onto the service with different enhancements, different marketing campaigns in order to get them on so they can see what a good service it is because let's face it, once a, the cost of an extra rider to us is almost nothing. You know, so the more riders we can get in the seats, the better it is for everybody. Modernization program. This is a program which was rolled out by our board recently and it encompasses PTC and rolling stock. I will address PTC in a moment, but essentially it's a, tra it's a train safety system. This 
project is estimated at $2.4 billion over 10 years. It doesn't really address Metro's other issues. It just addresses two things which we identified as being mission critical. It assumes $1.1 billion in, fund in funding from sources which already exist, which we have been able to identify and kind of carve off for that. There is another $1.3 billion needed. The sources of that are not yet identified. Positive train control. This is a computerized system coming over the next several years whose estimated cost is about $400 million. It was mandated by Congress following an accident in California. It integrates the switches, the signals, and the locomotives to help prevent unsafe train movement. So it literally has a map of the system. It tracks the trains. It understands what their braking vector is. And if a train looks like it's into in a case where it would be going at a speed such that it would not be able to brake in time, it would essentially take control of the train and stop it. This is not replacing or supplanting any of the safety systems which we have. It's essentially a new system which would be overlaid on top of the other safety and signal systems. You know, maybe someday it would uh, replace some of them, but that's not the plan at this time. So it's really just adding another layer of safety to the train operations. Rolling stock. The total cost to implement the proposed rolling stock program is about $2.1 billion over a 10-year period. And Metro would, in this program, purchase 367 cars, rehabilitate 455. We would increase our number of spares because that is becoming an issue both, we saw a little bit of this in the winter, but also as we upgrade for things like PTC, we're going to need to be able to take cars out of service so that we can do the necessary work on them. We would be purchasing 52 no locomotives, we would be rehabilitating 85 locomotives, and we would be making improvements to our 49th Street Yard where a lot of this work would be done. This is a sample 10-year financing plan, and let me underline in you know bold type the word sample, because especially the first line there, you know, it says Metro Revenue Bond Proceeds. Now, when we did our financing plan, when we did our budget, we put money in there which we anticipate would be enough to cover $100 million worth of financing. It's $8.4 million a year. And if you look at the RTA legislation, it says we can borrow, but the constraints on us are it has to be a level principal payment and it's capped at 25 years. So we put an amount in there that would let us borrow under those terms $100 million at 25 years at uh, about 4.3% interest. Now, will we actually issue bonds? Not necessarily. I mean, what we'd really like to do if we have our druthers is we'd like to find a car manufacturer who would issue us some kind of vendor financing, something like that. I'd really rather not go through the trouble of issuing a bond, but if that ends up being the lowest cost way or the best way, then that's what we'll do. Accounting systems renewal. We have been, we have an RFP out on the street which was issued. It was responded to. We have been doing interviews with various contestants, if you will, or proposals. And uh, what we are looking at is, you know, system functionality, the cost to install, lifetime costs, we're headed towards what I'm going to call a best-of-breed solution. What I mean by this is you can sometimes pick a large software provider and implement their system entirely. We have looked at that and decided that there are some providers who are specialists in certain things, such as timekeeping or project management and all that, and we believe that we would be better served in terms of cost and functionality to pick a few systems, and all of these are common systems, it's nothing esoteric or wild, uh, that are systems that are commonly used and integrate them together. So that um, project will hopefully improve our analytical capability and reduce some of our transaction time. We hope to have a selection made in the not-too-distant future and start implementing during the calendar year 2015. So we thank you very much for your interest in METRA, for your support of METRA, and at this time I would like to answer any questions that you might have. Tom, thank you very much for your uh, very informative presentation, and uh, METRA continues to do a good job based on the uh, independent reviews that, that uh, the RTA has had uh, direct with the users of the system. Um, a couple of things, I guess, uh, just before we open it up for all other questions, is that uh, this year I want to compliment you on getting your audit to us on time. In fact, you, instead of being 
not on time, you were the first one here. <laughs> so we want to thank you for that. That's been thank a problem, you. something that uh, we've had discussions on in past years, and, and that's, that's great. And also, uh, we're glad to see that you're moving forward with the financial system. Uh, that's uh, long overdue, as, as certainly you realize, and uh, it's going to be a tough uh, implementation process, but hopefully once you get it behind you, it'll, it'll be something that will really help everybody. Um, one of the things that everybody's been doing is holding public hearings uh, throughout the region, and I know that uh, Metro has held a number of those. How has this budget been impacted, if at all, by what you heard at the public hearings? Um, when we had the public hearings, we had some people who felt that uh, they didn't want to see a fare increase. And we had other people who felt strongly that we should have a fair increase because they wanted to see the system modernized and they wanted to, uh, and they understood the need to pay for it. So having taken all the uh, different comments into consideration, and our board does receive all the comments and they all do look at them, the board decided that the best course, given what they had been thinking about and given the public's comments was to proceed with the fare increase and proceed with attempting to modernize the system. So basically the, the input at the public hearings dealt primarily with fare increase uh, as, a, as a concern or as a discussion topic? That, that was a lot of it. Okay. The, um, I guess the other thing from looking at a, a, a budget of, of the size that you have is that uh, one of the things that we're always hearing whether it be the quarterly reports or whatever, is the need to increase ridership and how do you do that. And at the same time, the impact of raising fares will have on increasing ridership. Um, you show that you, you project a, a, an increase in, in growth. How do you see that happening and, and why would you project that at a time when you're increasing fares as well? Well, um, so for 2015, we have projected a 1.1% decrease in ridership. And but we believe that that will be largely a transitory decrease because when we had our last fare increase a couple of years ago, when we increased fares 25%, what we saw was there was kind of a delay period and then ridership took a dip and then that ridership essentially returned. So, and, and you know, of course, there's a lot of things going on in the world, uh, you know, the economic changes, job changes, people work from home, all that sort of stuff. But we have assumed that something similar would happen, that there would be a transitory leaving followed by a return to the system. Okay. I'd like to open it up to other questions and comments, and I have a couple more at the end. Uh, Director Colson. I would like a set of these uh, slides, by the way, because we get a lot of questions along these lines. That would be helpful. Sure. Um, talked about uh, ridership and capital needs. Um, my train was 35 minutes late out of Glenview today and they said it was due to signal problems and everybody chuckled because we hear that all the time. Are there any, is there any capital solution to this because this might affect your ridership as well? Um, every year if you look at the capital program we put a significant amount of money into signal upgrades. Um, the other thing that's happening is as PTC comes in, we are upgrading switches, upgrading other hardware as a function of that because some of the hardware needs to be upgraded with that. So we're continuously looking at the signal system and trying to upgrade it as best we can given our, given our capital constraints. I would not expect, un until our capital needs are fully met, I would expect that, you know, we will continue to not have as modern a system as we would like. Well, what is a signal problem? What, what does that mean when we hear that? Well, a signal, a signal problem essentially means that there's a break somewhere in the circuit. So the signal system is set up so that all the tracks and everything else are on a circuit. And if anywhere a break occurs, so if the track had a break or if the signal system had a break or anything else, it all goes red. Everything comes to a freeze because the, the system essentially says, I don't know what's going on, so everything come to a stop until we figure it out. And then you chase it until you figure out what the issue was, and it could be just a... Um, you know, a switch, uh, well, it could be anything. I wouldn't speculate. And so that's the way the system is designed as a fail-safe. And, you know, you will, you will always see some of that because sometimes it is legitimate issues going on. Sometimes it is just a signal problem. 
It sounds like that could be cured by some new technology or something. Is that right? Uh, certainly we could improve the number of instances that are there, but I don't think it will ever go away because, like I said, there are always real problems why the signal is down also. Okay, and then you talked about your relationship with the freight railroads. Uh, don't you also realize some revenue? I see the CP freights running on your line past Milwaukee all the time. Do, you pay, we, do they pay for that? I assume they do. Anybody who runs on our rails, we have negotiated trackage fees with them. And most of these trackage agreements are fairly long-term agreements. So, you know, one of the things that's been said is, you know, well, can't you charge them more? And, you know, in a lot of cases, the answer is, well, maybe, but the agreement runs till 2038 or something like that. So, you know, I don't have a lot of opportunity to crack these agreements open. But certainly as they come due for negotiation, we try to uh, negotiate a good deal. You know the ballpark of the revenue that Metro realized from the freight railroads? From trackage? Yeah. Uh, maybe $30 million. Okay, maybe, maybe $20 million a year. Okay, that's significant. All right, well, thank you. That's all I have. Other questions? Director Ferreira. Tom, uh, you talk about energy savings undertakings. Uh, what is it an anticipated? Well, so one of our ICE projects is uh, the green vehicles. So we're hoping to move to hybrid vehicles, perhaps uh, also get into con compressed air, or I'm sorry, compressed natural gas or other type of alternative fuels. And that when I talk about that, I'm talking about what I call rubber tire vehicles. In other words, not Not, not, uh, sort of not your diesel engines. Right. Well, and so with the diesel engines themselves, we've done a couple of things. One is we've purchased recently three Model F59 locomotives. They have a different engine than the standard engine. Most of them run on an EMD 12-cylinder uh, engine, or I'm sorry, 16-cylinder engine. And we recently purchased, so it says 16645, they call it in the trade. And we recently purchased three locomotives that have what they call a 12710, meaning it's a 710 cubic inch cylinder with 12 cylinders. And it has been claimed that we would see significant fuel savings from those. So we actually purchased a few so we can put them on the lines and test them and see if in our duty cycle we actually achieve this. And when I say that, what I mean is, our duty cycle, because we try hard to maintain our schedule, is one of fairly rapid acceleration or rapid deceleration, which is a much different duty cycle than you would see in a freight going across the country where they get up to speed once and then they roll across the Great Plains at 70 miles an hour and then they come to a stop uh, in California or something like that. So we're going to test those for ourselves. We are participating in some research on alternative fuels for locomotives, but frankly I don't expect that to bear any fruit for a couple of years. The, the issue is, one, finding things that are clean enough burning to meet emission standards, and two, finding something which is what we call energy dense, meaning literally you don't want to have something that's so non-energy dense that you have to haul a tender around behind you or something like that. You would like something that you can fit in the tank. So there's a lot of speculation about what the fuel of the future might be, and I don't know that there's a good answer, but I suspect in the next 12 to 18 months the research will probably settle on a couple of likely candidates and then the next step will be they will actually build prototype engines and run them for several thousand hours in different duty cycles maybe two or three years from now you'll actually see something like that in service thank you your uh, your concentration is going to be though uh, the immediate concentration is going to be on rubber tire vehicles yes sir and you're talking about uh, uh, compressed gas and that well, well, we'll look at the compressed gas. Certainly the hybrid vehicles are something we can do right now, and, and we plan to make some. As a matter of fact, we already have made some purchases, and we're planning to continue that. Thank you. Other questions? Chairman uh, Dillard? Thank you, Tom. We appreciate the cooperation very much. and You're doing a, an excellent job. Um, when your modernization program gets up, and we have purchased uh, new cars, and we've purchased and renovated some new locomotive engines. Do you see any reduction in your operating costs because of the new capital expenditures? Yes, we do. It's a little bit difficult to put my arms around them right now, but for example, on the Metro Electric, we have been in procuring new cars. We've got a program to buy 160, of which we've got about 80. We recently, in this budget cycle, we realized savings about $1.3 million. 
you know, materials and personnel. We expect to see more when the rest of them are in. So we expect to see savings, but until I get a little bit better idea what the cars are, what they look like, it'll be a little tough for me to give you exact numbers. Um, on the issue of, of possibly bonding and going out for, for public financing of new equipment versus finding a vendor that might uh, have a finance agreement with you, what, what do you think will be your time frame? When will you know whether a vendor will uh, allow you to, you know, to finance, like, like I buy a car or, or something like that? And if you do have to go out uh, and issue bonds, um, as stated in the RTA Act, you gotta you gotta come here. Um, what's what's the timing of that? Well, um, the timing would be uh, mid next year, and we've already got the financing in our budget in terms of the amount we would like to finance, the amount we would like to spend in our capital budget, and the capital provision for it. So I think we believe that essentially by approving our budget, you're giving your blessing to that. And it's a fairly, it's a fairly modest request at this time. You know, like I said, it's $8.4 million a year, which is, you know, easily covered within, within our budget. So during the first part of 2015, that situation should crystallize. Um, we are in a unique period, one that I thought I might not see again. I paid $2.49 for a gallon of gasoline yesterday in, in downstate Illinois. Um, obviously, you, you have different blends of gasoline, but um, are, you, are you looking into every option there is now to lock in while fuel prices are low? And, uh, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's the same issue for all three service boards, but we're at a, a very good time, a good period uh, with respect to fuel contracts. Um, how far into the future are you locked in to, you know, the prices that we all thought we're going to we're going to we're going to soar, but in fact they're coming down. Where, where are you at fuel price looking right now? Um, we are looking right now at perhaps uh, going out into the future. Right now we have some contracts which take uh, about 80 percent of our budget through the end of this calendar year. You know, that's kind of a normal part of our budget process. And we've discussed with our purchasing group extending some of our contracts so that we could look to lock down in the future. And then, uh, last but not least, Jumping on Director Colson's question, when he asked for the slides, the slide that that shows the consumer price index versus pure railroads, um, I would run that baby in, in in the byline newsletter that you have in every car all the time, so that that people understand, um, you know, that they're getting a good value on Metra, mm -hmm. that our fares, even after the anticipated ones that are long overdue, are coming. Uh, where we relate to our peer railroads. I just think that one slide, more than anything else, helps educate the, the riders. Um, I had a man today when I was coming in uh, uh, from Hinsdale. Um, I'm sitting there, and I'm in a, in a lower seat, and he comes over. There's not a lot of anonymity when you're riding out of your hometown station. Uh, and he comes over, and he sits next to me in the middle of a Cicero yard. We're doing what you want. We're going 70 miles an hour. And he says... Uh, got a question for you um he said uh, you know will the new cars yeah, interfere this is tony increase? anderson my apologies for being a few minutes late welcome tony um he says you know will it make a difference in in terms of of you know reliability and you know when i guaranteed him um you know that it will certainly help uh and it's long overdue and he was fine with the fair like most other riders i see as long as we can translate it into better service uh, it's not even so much comfort that it's just more reliability. Um, you know, he was fine with the fare increase, but he just came up and, you know, and I told him, you know, what, what pure railroads are like and that we, you know, we're probably long overdue for the kinds of changes that we made. And then he got off with me, and can we, I just sort of pointed out some of the cars that I know were purchased in the 19, late 1950s and said, you know, that car is as old as I am, and I'm old infrastructure. Um, so I'd, I'd lay that slide in the, in the buy, buy level or whatever we call that newsletter so that the real day-to-day -day riders understand, um, you know, where, where we are, especially compared to our peer railroads. But thank you so much for your cooperation. I know B and Leanne and, and the staff, Donna, uh, we very much appreciate uh, your, your, your willingness to cooperate and your candor. You've got a tough job.
Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, yes, I have a few questions. Um, thank you so much for being here today. Appreciate it. Um, fuel, what percent of the total operating budget is fuel? Uh, about 11, 11, 12 percent, something like that. Okay, so it's a, it's, it's a much Sorry. lower percentage than I had anticipated. Uh, the, the, and, and how far has fuel prices fallen? I mean, in terms of a percentage basis, about 10 percent, something like that? or That's fair. That's fair. Okay. Um, and then the metro fare increase, uh, what percentage of that fare increase is going to increased operating costs that you project, and what percentage going to, you know, capital or capital servicing? Um, we put one, so it was a 10.8% 10, 10 increase, and 1% of that was going to our capital, and another 2% uh, of that was going to... Uh, fair, what we call fair box capital, which is uh, pay-as-you-go capital, if you will, as opposed to long-term financing. And the rest was for either inflationary increases or increased maintenance spending because of the age of the fleet or to fund uh, the operating costs of PTC. Okay, so about, oh, all right, well, uh, so I was going to say 70% is due to increased operating costs, but you, you threw the PTC in there on me and that uh, that threw me for a loop there. Uh, so that PTC is maybe another 10 percent, 15 percent? The PTC was 1 percent of it, which was uh, $3 million. Okay, so you've got about 4 percent, or, or I'm sorry, 40 percent going to capital and 60 percent going to operating costs. Okay, fair enough. Um, also, this year, uh, through all, all the uh, finance offices, RTA and the service boards, you've uh, – participated in a new budgeting process, which I think is great, and I think it reduced a lot of the uh, stress for everybody involved. Um, do you see, I mean, did that work well for you, and do you see any hiccups with the implementation of that as we move forward? I think it generally worked well. You know, every um, all the participants, uh, including the RTA staff, all, you know, everybody worked well together, and I thought it went quite well. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Yes. Um, uh, first of all, thank you for being here, and uh, <clears throat> I hope these questions weren't a function of my not taking Metro this morning because that was why I was late. I apologize. Um, um, first of all, on the, one of the comments I hear quite frequently is lack of Wi-Fi, and I didn't know if you covered that in your comments, but do you have plans to install Wi-Fi networking on Metro trains? The Wi-Fi is being studied right now. We've got an RFP out, and we're evaluating the responses, and I would hope that sometime in early next year we would have answers to that, but I don't have one right now. Okay, because that is something that a lot of riders do comment about, and it would really enhance their experience because they could work while they're on the train. Um, you talked about the off-peak fare, or actually the capacity that exists in the system, particularly during the off-peak hours and uh, plans to try and bring more riders onto the metro system. What are some of the specifics in that regard? Are you still in the early stages of formulating what your plan will be? Well, so essentially we're running just as full as we could possibly be with the trains running into the city during the morning rush hour and, you know, kind of the opposite. The trains are about as full as they could possibly be running out of the city in the evening rush hour. During the rest of the time, there's um, a fair amount of slack, and there's a few things happening right now. The first is we are doing radio and TV ads to market the Metro service. The second thing is we are doing the promotional campaigns that I discussed earlier. The first one is the enhanced service on the Rock Island to try and entice people into using our weekend service, um, trying it there. And the special event service is something that will come in from all corners of the system. Hopefully people will ride us for a special event because for various reasons it's difficult to get downtown by car and just realize that we have a good service and continue to use it. So those are the things we have going right now. Is there any plan to, to use like price as an incentive because a lot of times if you make the price low enough, somebody might take uh, the metro system, um, say, on the weekends or in off-peak hours? So next year, we are we have an RFP in process right now to study 
our ridership, which would look at our zones, our pricing patterns, all that sort of stuff. And we hope to use the results of that study to guide us in anything like that. Okay. All right. Time, two more questions and I'll be done. Um, can, I, we, can I, Tom, but also, I mean, your weekend fare is a discounted rate, so you do have a reduced weekend fare and you, you have different pricing for other things like that as well. Yes. Yes. Yeah, I, I, I misspoke. It's a fair pricing study, not not a ridership study per se. Um, the uh, earlier uh, we had had conversations about um, the need for uh, equipment and the conversation about lease versus buy. Um, that was being studied uh, to determine whether or not that was a viable option for Metro. What's the status of that? Well. As the as I discussed the plan earlier, we are going to go out with RFPs to equipment vendors, and we're going to ask them for kind of a two-pronged proposal. The first one is going to be what can you deliver and at what price in terms of the rolling stock. And then the second one is going to be what financing options are you going to offer us. So we're going to ask them to provide us anything they might be able to give us in terms of equipment leasing, in terms of uh, financing themselves, other options like that. So we will evaluate all those when they come in, and we'll pick whatever is the cheapest, frankly, at least in terms of the financing. So it would be through dealer financing as opposed to third-party lease financing? Is that correct? Uh, one of the options that we would hope that they might pursue is pairing up with some kind of a bank or a financing company. Certainly we know that many of the big manufacturers are already more or less lined up with banks, and they have had discussions, but it's been no more than idle chat at this point, about going to that bank and asking them to team up on a financing package with them. Okay. Great. Uh, thank you. Finally, um, and this is a question I'm going to have for all the service boards, it, uh, your supplier diversity program, how effective has that been? Are you pleased with the results? Um, are there steps to improve it? Um, anything you can share in that regard? You've asked a question that's kind of out of my field of expertise, and I'm going to have to ask somebody else to get back to you with an answer. Okay. Well, thank you, John. Yeah, I, uh, I see a, a nice smiling conductor uh, over here, and I'm sorry about the incident at Baroque uh, the other, other morning. Uh, what struck me a little bit is when 1,100 people that would ride a train, a metro train, uh, is there any other conductors, is there any other personnel on those cars, or is it just one conductor? You have two, sometimes three conductors slash uh, ticket takers, depending on the train. Okay, so there, there's multiple. Yes. Based on the eight-pack, six-pack, whatever it's going to be. Okay, thank you. Tom, uh, Director Hobson brought up the... Mike. Brought up the uh, changes that were made to the budget process this year, uh, primarily uh, changes that were brought forth by the service boards wanting to see additional action taken by the board to make things easier and, and better for the service boards. Um, one of the major changes um, certainly is having the reserve fund that, that uh, I've always talked about and, and I know this board has been concerned about, and that is um, no longer uh, an item that, that the RTA board is providing for because we've been asked to disperse those funds out to the service boards. Um, we are going to do hopefully a, a review on how that should really work and what the role of the service boards would be to make sure it works. I guess the question I have for you today is what, what kind of reserve fund do you have in the budget that's before us today for that unlikely event that always does occur when you're not anticipating it? What, what, have you, what have you built into your budget for reserves, and how will you operate if it goes beyond a reserve that you have? Well, so there's a couple of answers to that question. You know, the first one is, does the budget itself actually have any slack funds? And the answer is no, not really. The answer, the budget is all based on a set of assumptions, and there isn't something else set aside that says there's X million dollars of provision for a whoops. That's, that's not there. So in that sense, the budget monies are all fully spoken for. In terms of uh, cash on hand, you know, if something dramatic was to happen, I would presume that metric could exist for a few months until 
something happened. I mean, it depends on the magnitude of what you're saying. I mean, if you're saying the whole world shut down and there was no money coming in, that would obviously dissipate things faster. But I don't, I don't know if that's a realistic assumption. Maybe an assumption would be that uh, sales tax and ridership may be cut by half or something like that. And, you know, you're talking a couple of months, and then we're – at that point, the board has to – well, as soon as something like that happened, the board would have to make some decisions because clearly we'd run dry quickly. From an accounting standpoint, um, what type of reserve do you think you should have with an operation the size of yours from a budgeting standpoint? You know, well, uh, I, I, I th let's see. I think that's more of a finance question than an accounting question. But um, – from a from a finance point of view, at this point, I think I would rather see us look towards a line of credit or something like that as a group, because I don't know that I like the idea of having a lot of money sitting around doing nothing, having what you might call a negative carry. Um, you know, so, so I, I think I would rather see us as an organization try to see if we could band together and get a central line of credit that we could all dip into should something like that occur. You know, if the line look, of credit would certainly be a plan on how you were going to deal with a problem like that. So I think that's I guess that's what I'm getting to. Hopefully, as we move forward and have a review done of that area of this whole question, we'll be able to get the cooperation of Metra when we go through that process. Of oh yes. Because Who's going to be doing what? Because we really, at this point, don't have a, a, a plan. <laughs> You're right. And, you know, if you if you look at the costs to obtain, a, um, a, let's say, a $100 million line of credit, which is, you know, you'd need something significant for a group this size, maybe to be more than that. I'm talking about all the service boards and the, Met and the RTA put together. You know, you have your legal fees, but they don't really get any bigger as a line of credit gets bigger. But you can probably lock up $100 million for something like 30 basis points or something like that, which is a few hundred thousand dollars a year, and that might be a very wise insurance policy for us to talk about. Thank you. Are there any other questions or comments? No, I think we certainly appreciate your time uh, coming before us today. Thank you very and, much. Uh, we look forward to uh, finishing this in, at our December, what, 18th meeting, I believe it is? Thank you. Is it the 19th or? 17th. 17th. Okay, the 17th meeting. Okay, and now we're going to hear from the CTA. Uh, Ron Denard, please. Good morning and welcome, Ron. Thank you for coming. Okay. Uh, good morning, everyone. Ron Denard, CFO for the CTA. And, and I first want to start off by really thanking uh, the other CFOs and specifically uh, B. Rayner Hickey and her staff with this budget process because they work very closely with this and, and were very instrumental in making the process much smoother. So, so since Tom uh, uh, gave us some interesting facts ab uh, about Metra, I, decide, I decided I would pull out some interesting facts about uh, CTA. <laughs> <laughs> the, the CTA's coverage area is 234 square miles and, th and 35 suburbs. 82% of the public transit trips uh, in this area are through the CTA. We have 1,885 buses, 128 routes, uh, 11,048 stops. We have 1,400 rail cars, 145 stations, and 221,000 rail miles of travel per day. Just to give you an interesting perspective. Oh, oh okay. okay. <laughs> Now what to Okay, for, for so for the twenty fifteen budget, it's a one point four four billion dollar balanced budget. It's the fourth straight year that we are balanced. Our fares are frozen. There's no service reductions. 
There's no capital transfers. We have numerous improvements to our bus and rail service. Uh, we have a continued uh, investment in our modernization, and our goal is reliable service and customer convenience. And I won't go through all of these, but there's been an evolution since 2011 when, uh, when Forrest Claypool took over. It was a $308 million deficit, and we did various different uh, management in initiatives from uh, renegotiating our labor contracts. We put in, and, and some of these I'll talk about in more detail as we, you know, as we go further. Uh, we, we changed our health care program. Uh, we... We created our open fair system and implement, you know, implemented that program. And, and going forward, we're going to have also enhance that system with a, a v actual Ventra app launch in 2015. So there's no, so as we like to say, there's no more doomsday. And also very important, there's no more transfers from capital to operating budget. We, we manage our operating budget and since 2011, after 2011, there's been no transfers from capital to operating. Now I'll have uh, Tom to go through a few of our initiatives that help us with these balance, help us be able to balance our budget over the years. Uh, thanks, Ron. Tom McCone, uh, VP of Budget and Capital Finance. I wanted to go through some of the, the major items that are, are delivering savings to help us achieve this balanced operating budget. Uh, many of them will be familiar to this board because they've been a part of prior budgets. Uh, the first is uh, the labor savings. So through the negotiated labor agreement, the first one in, in decades, we achieved uh, savings in the, in the wage gro growth and also savings in the, in the health care program, and those have materialized to help us realize this balanced budget. Um, we've taken management, management initiatives to, to reduce absenteeism, uh, and also a part of uh, some of our actually labor savings and enhanced service, um, expanding something like the Second Chance Program, which uh, in, uh, in decreases the general clean cycle, so it increases the number of times that buses and rail cars are getting, getting clean more frequently, delivers cleaner vehicles. Uh, it's also a Second Chance Program for, for ex-offenders. We actually have a, a quote here that uh, President Claypool delivered um, at the, the City Club meeting uh, last week. Go ahead, B. This is from one of those, uh, one of those uh, actually former apprentices, <coughs> current employees, um, where uh, you can see the impact not only in getting delivering cleaner, cleaner vehicles, but also the impact that, that we've been able to make on people's lives. And this is all because of uh, we were able to include this as part of the uh, part of the labor agreement um, and allow for it within within our operating budget. Go ahead, B. Um, some other things to, to point out in terms of the management initiatives delivering savings. Uh, we talked a little bit about savings um, on, on fuel at, with the Metro presentation. Uh, we've, we've gone to a forward purchasing um, strategy for, for fuel and for power. That's allowed us to lock in lower prices and make sure that we have budget certainty, uh, take, taking out actually some of the, the uncertainty that even comes with hedging just to do a, a straightforward purchase. Uh, we're, we're continuing our overhaul of over 1,000 buses. In addition, we've added new buses in 13. We're adding new buses in 14. We're adding new buses in 15. We're adding new buses in 16, 16 which are improving our defect rate, um, eliminating, eliminating breakdowns, um, saving up to $2.6 million annually. And we wanted to mention also we've, we've switched from using D1 diesel fuel to D2. And so we'll, we'll use a blend during the winter, but in, during the warmer months, we use straight D2, which is a significant savings in fuel. Thank you. Good point. Uh, additionally, uh, one, one example here of efficient scheduling, we're maximizing our resources. We're using uh, more 60-foot buses um, to, to improve the customer experience, but also it Im improves our, our operating costs as well. Um, and with, with the new rail vehicles that are, that are coming into place, we've dropped our average fleet, fleet age from 28 years to 18 years. We actually, versus our peers two years ago, we had the oldest fleet. Now we're middle of the pack in terms of, in terms of our fleet age. The, the FTA guidelines for a, a rail fleet like ours, they say the standard minimum useful life is 25 years. So our average age was beyond that minimum useful, that, that useful life age uh, identified by the FTA. And with that, we've seen an improvement in our defect rate. We've, we've seen savings per mile and, and savings annually in terms of our, our maintenance costs. 
Uh, this is taken um, straight from na from national figures, and it's also included in the RTA's sub sub regional report. Again, showing our operating expense per passenger mile as compared to our peers for both bus and rail, showing that we are um, at the front or second, depending on which mode that you're looking at. Very competitive and actually sort of leading the country, and we actually get a lot of calls from agencies asking us about sort of what we're doing to achieve savings across uh, across the board. So I'll talk about our supply chain re uh, reform. Uh, in the past, we had up to $100 million of inventory. So we decided to uh, outsource the management of our inventory. We actually used the, the auto supply company, Napa. So Napa actually buys our inventory now. So we say both from a cash flow standpoint and also they manage our inventory. And we've been able to bring our inventory down from $100 million in the past down to uh, $50 million. And you can see from the pictures how we had a lot of excess in old inventory and now we've sold it, cleared it out, and Napa now manages and carries the balance. And that's just a graph showing uh, the decline in inventory. Uh, another way that we, that we are trying to be more efficient, we have been increasing our advertising revenue. So we have a, a firm uh, that we use, a Titan Advertising, and they have been increasing our advertising uh, every year, also using digital advertising and you may have seen around the city, they've put up what we, what we call these urban panels and where they advertise around the city uh, also. We've increased our parking rev our revenue. We've increased the minimum average guarantee for 2015. And we've also increased our, our concession, concession contracts. So from... And so I want to just talk about some uh, aspects of our what we call customer service. Uh, we've networked over 23,000 security cameras, and those cameras have also helped reduce crimes on the CTA, and sometimes they're used uh, in solving crimes around the CTA. Uh, all the rail sta stations now have the train tracker digital signs, which our customers love, and there's also bus tracker signs that are around on some of the bu uh, bus shelters. Uh, our, we insourced our rail station uh, coverage, and we now have hired a 1,000 new uh, customer service agents that help people out when they go to the stations and answer questions, uh, and we think that that's been a very successful, and it also say, uh, saved us money. And we've uh, completed our transition of, of Ventra, uh, and, you know, it's a, a open, fair system, and it allows our, uh, our customers to use the same card on whether it's uh, CTA, PACE, or they can even uh, use a credit card if it has a blink technology. That, that's just a picture of some of the uh, train tracker signs. That's one of the er first urban panels, and we also have, of course, our, our mobile apps. Yeah, th these are pictures of our new uh, our rail, rail cars and, and the bus fleet. You know, we're upgrading the fleet. You know, we have over 1,300 rail cars. You know, we're over 1,400 at, at this point. Um, and then you can see that, you know, with, our, with the overhaul process and with the delivery of the new buses, we have essentially a, an, an all-new um, fleet within the, within the next few years. So, uh, so let's talk about, uh, I just want to talk about some of our financings uh, in 2014. So we, uh, we issued $555 million of our sales tax bonds. Because uh, last year interest rates were some of the lowest in history, we ac actually issued uh, bonds for 2014 and uh, 2015. By delaying when we originally were going to is uh, issue, we saved about $78 million uh, of interest. Also, uh, we had a, a world-class financing team, and we had 54% minority participation uh, in our, uh, on our financing team. We also uh, have closed on uh, TIFIA, our TIFIA bonds, the Transportation uh, Infrastructure Finance, and 
uh, Innovation Act bonds, but these TIF, uh, these they're not bonds. They're really a loan. They're TIFIA loans. They're a federal loan. And what's great about the TIFIA loan is it acts more like a credit line. So you you get approved for it, but you don't have to borrow against it until you actually need it, when you're actually going to pay the bill. So it actually is more efficient from a financial standpoint even than bonds, and because it's federally backed, uh, the interest rates are actually cheaper. If we were to issue them today, it would be about 2.9%. Uh, so we close on a $79.2 million TIFIA loan for the 95th Street uh, project. We also had... Uh, refinance and bus leases, and we had present value savings of about $10 million. So we try to be efficient in our financings, and I'll talk about what our plans for 2015-2016. Uh, right now, we're, we're looking at possibly issuing $145 million of sales tax bonds in 2016, we don't really know what the structure is going to be yet. It we'll, uh, depends on market conditions. We'll work with our financial advisors, our investment bankers. We'll talk to investors, and that's when we'll determine what is the, uh, what is the best type of structure that we would put in place, whether it's fixed, variable, secured, unsecured, accelerated, deferred. Um, and we're also looking at uh, additional TIFIA loans, uh, in 2015 for various different uh, various different projects. And if the market continues to hold, we may have a refinancing uh, opportunity in 2015 that would uh, uh, give us additional savings over the life of, of some of our older bonds. I want to uh, go, through, go through some of the ICE-funded projects. We certainly appreciate what this board uh, was able to do with uh, the, the funding this year, uh, especially for the ICE program. Uh, so to describe a few of those projects, um, I'm actually going to skip over the, the mobile application. Um, I'm going to speak about that in a couple slides here. Uh, communications equipment uh, upgrade and enhancements. Um, we have film-based equipment. We are now in the digital age, so it is time for us to get rid of our film-based equipment. So that is what some of the communications funds are going to go to, should greatly enhance what we're able to do with our uh, communications resources. Uh, we're going to continue with our, our camera installations and actually speed up the, the video downloading, especially from the, from the vehicles, by providing uh, coverage in, the, in, in things like the rail yards to help download these, these videos a lot faster. Um, it's really going to create a lot of efficiencies for, 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 our, for, our, um, for our processes. Um, and then, you know, as we look to how do we continue to get those efficiencies going forward, uh, we're, we're investing in technology, um, using technology to, to, to help us innovate and deliver these, these savings, labor savings, other savings, um, with a lot of our administrative tasks, uh, with our workforce efficiency, our work order system for all the repairs that we're doing across our vehicles and, and our facilities. And then, uh, similar, similar to Metra, um, optimizing our enterprise systems. I mean, it's, it's, it's a huge business. It's $1.44 billion and operating. So we need to make sure that we have the systems in place to, to, to help support that. So I want actually Mike Gwynn here to talk a little bit about further about the Ventra application. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman and members of the, the uh, board. My name is Mike Gwynn, Director of Revenue and Fair Systems for CTA. Uh, the, the Ventra mobile app, which we announced uh, uh, just a, a few weeks ago, uh, is uh, we're very excited about it. We, we view it as a state-of-the-art, first-of-its-kind mobile application. It will integrate all three um, service boards, the different regional fare payment systems, and that's key because it's both in the gated and gateless environment. At first, it will support Apple devices and Android devices. Uh, we will expand it as, as necessary uh, in, in later builds. And it will feature regular releases of enhancements built into the contract. We want this to not just be state-of-the-art right now, but will, to continue to be state-of-the-art over the life of, uh, of the contract. It will put a Ventra vending machine in the pocket of everyone with a smartphone. Uh, it will have account management tools where you'll be able to check your balance, buy passes, add value. It will also have active push notifications if you get a low balance, if you go negative, if your pass is expiring, which will greatly enhance the, uh, the customer experience, especially for people at uh, bus stops who don't have the benefit of, vendor, of uh, venture vending machines you know, on, out on the street corner. Um, it, uh, as, as was uh, mentioned before, it will feature the Metro Mobile Ticketing, 
that lays the groundwork for future integration of uh, Ventra into Metro's operations. It will have trip tool integration for both bus tracker, train tracker, and Metro scheduling, and fully integrated into the whole experience, so you'll be able to immediately buy a Metro ticket straight from that scheduling feature, which should be a, a, a very useful um, uh, component. And finally, door-to-door uh, -door trip planning, so uh, not just the schedule base, but it will help you wayfind around the system. It will uh, feature advertising and promotional content, uh, and uh, in future releases, it will have uh, the ability to download a virtual Ventra card, so your mobile phone will turn into that silver Ventra card, and you can just tap it on a reader uh, on a bus uh, or at the rail stations uh, and, and be on your way, turning your smartphone into the truly universal fare card at, at that point. Uh, as I mentioned, it, it will uh, be released in phases. Uh, phase 1 will be testing in February of 15 with a general release uh, later in 2015. That will have the account management features, the push notifications, and Metro Mobile ticketing. Phase 2, which uh, we anticipate later in 15, will have uh, trip tools, uh, the uh, uh, tracker-based information, as well as some additional Metro enhancements. Phase 3, which also is later in 15, will have that door-to-door -door, uh, trip planning. And then Phase 4, which is in later 15 or early 2016, will have that virtual venture card. Uh, but these are just the planned phases. As I mentioned, this will be a living application. We'll take advantage of new functionality that comes on in phones and in operating systems. Uh, so we'll have future phases rolled out over the life of the contract. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Thanks, Mike. I uh, wanted to also provide the board an uh, update on, on ridership. Uh, rail ridership is uh, in, in forecast and forecast within our budget documents. Um, in 2014, it's expected to be the highest um, since we actually began keeping modern records in 1961. So rail ridership has been uh, very, very robust. We're seeing the benefits of the investments that, that we made in the system. Um, overall system ridership uh, will remain over uh, half a billion rides, so well over the 500 uh, million, million mark for the year. Uh, we're projecting that to continue continue next year as well, so we continue to see that uh, uh, robust ridership. Uh, overall, system ridership is, is down a bit, 1.3% in October. It's down 3.1% year-to-date uh, compared to 2013. Uh, of note, in particular, you know we've we've looked at bus ridership. You know, bus ridership has a lot of unique factors uh, affecting it this year. Um, in particular, it was hit harder by the polar vortex than the rail system was. Both of them both of them were hit by the polar vortex. The bus system was was hit a little a little bit harder. Uh, we know that the, the the price of gas is dropping, continues to drop. Um, you know, uh, auto vehicle trips, the price of gas actually affects uh, bus a little bit more than it does rail. That's primarily because bus trips are a little bit shorter. Um, the speed of the streets. We continue to work with our partners uh, at the Chicago Department of Transportation, um, the other transportation agencies that, that affect the, the streets. Um, we know that um, streets are getting slower. This is a phenomenon that's happening across the country, um, and we need to look at ways to, 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 to speed them up. And we continue to do that, and you'll see so, some of those uh, programs coming into place next year with things like the Central Loop BRT system. Um, alternative transportation options, um, this is something that uh, we've actually talked to RTA uh, staff about. There are more alternatives out there today, um, from, from Divi to Uber. Uber to other to other methods of getting around. We know that you know the bus and and the automobile are com competing with more other factors. Um, and last year, you know, 2013 specifically, as you compare it to 2014, you know, we, we the red line south was shut down for five months. We had free bus shuttles in place. We had a 50 cent fare discount um, south of 63rd Street. So a, a lot of those inflated um, some of the bus numbers last last year because because of that. So comparisons become, between 13 and 14 become a little bit more difficult because of that. And actually, of note, in 2014, we actually had 10 fewer school days in 2014 than we did in 20 in, in 2013. And a lot of that was because of the impacts of the of the strike and how that shifted the school year in in 2013 and we know that on school days we actually experience quite a bit more bus ridership than on than on non-school days uh, and we continue to, to talk to our partners um, uh, national partners and this is you know a lot of them are seeing similar similar things in terms of uh, their bus system and and their rail system so um, that's that's where we stand um, with ridership today and we're projecting slight increases next year uh, more on the rail than, than on the bus but we think some of these one-time factors We'll, we'll, we'll go away next year. 
I'm not going to go through all these capital program highlights. Uh, it was one of the, d- the discussion points we wanted to go through, just show, hey, this is a lot of what's out there, vehicles, investments in infrastructure, investments um, across the system in, in station. So uh, on the next few slides, we'll show you some pictures of some of the, the big pieces of the, of the capital program that are coming into place next year. So go ahead, B. Uh, the upgrade uh, of the subway cellular system to 4G, um, which will provide cell phone coverage, um, n- not at 2G, but at 4G on the platforms and then throughout the tubes as well. So it's a, it's a, it's a really big enhancement for our, our customers in the subway system. Uh, next slide. Uh, Wilson Station renovation, where there's been a little bit of preliminary work done, done there next year, you know, d- d- pushing much much bigger into renovating the Wilson Station, making it a modern transfer station and a, and a, and a much bigger uh, community asset as well. Next slide. Uh, reconstructing the 95th Street Terminal, so go, building two buildings there across each side of, of 95th Street Station. Uh, this is the, the largest bus terminal in the system. It's the fifth largest rail station in the system, um, well-deserving of, of, of an upgrade for us. Um, houses not only CTA but also PACE um, and some of the, um, uh, the countrywide bus systems like Greyhound as well. Uh, and then here, uh, continue planning for red-purple modernization along with the red line extension. So this is an image of one of the, the stations there. Go ahead, B. And then this is the central loop BRT we mentioned, just, a, again, a conceptual drawing for some of the, the improvements that we expect to see um, continuing, uh, continuing on the system next year. So, so, so what we really what, – what all this means to us is we, we provide transportation – we have the support of of the mayor. Uh, we appreciate the support of the RTA and its board. We su- we appreciate the support of our board. Um, CTA we feel brings job good. Well, we'll put it this way: good transit brings jobs to the reason to the region, and CTA also creates jobs. That wasn't. You can see examples of headquarters that moved uh, to the Chicago area, and some of their decision was based on uh, the convenience of transit. Thank you very much. Thank you very much uh, for the excellent uh, presentation. And again, if we could get copies of that, I think it would really be beneficial. Yes. Having uh, been involved in the budget uh, back prior to the 2011 dates that you were talking about, um, I can only echo what you have said. Uh, the achievement that you and President Claypool and your board have made since that time are absolutely uh, commendable. I mean, when, when you mentioned the word doomsday, that's the way we would start our budget process mm-hmm. back in 09 and 10. It was always the doomsday. So you guys have now become the doomsday <laughs> slayers because right. we don't have that anymore. And I think Great. that's... I can't tell you, I mean, what an accomplishment that is, especially looking at all the things that you've done since 2011. Um, right, anyway, thank I'd, you very much. I'd like to open it up for questions. Yes, Director Melvin. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, congratulations. Uh, great report. And uh, thank you so much for giving us some context in the beginning and then taking us through the history to remind us of where you've come from. Um, just good work. And uh, as I was on my way in here, I ran into a buddy of mine who uses CTA every day, and he just – talked about what, what a, he feels it's a better value than ever, actually. So uh, I think that's consistent. Um, and when I use the buses, the buses are much cleaner, and I like that a lot. Uh, one thing I do want to say is that on that transaction that was 54% uh, minority participation, it's generally considered that that was a very well-placed deal. Um, so it's very, very well done and very well received by the marketplace. I just want to make note of that. Congratulations. Thank you. And thank you. And uh, an- anecdotally, you know, we actually, besides rating agency presentations, we actually did investor presentations, and we went uh, and talked to J.P. Morgan, who initially wasn't going to participate in the deal, and after talking to them and talking to them about uh, the the strength of the region, they actually came in for $100 million out of the, the 555 That's great. Yes, Director Lewis. Uh, th- um, around the excellent presentation and with uh, Chris's question, it's a perfect opportunity for me to ask my question about supplier diversity. Uh, obviously, that was um, part of what you did on the bond issue, and it 
it improves the um, overall quality of the product. Do you have a minority supplier diversity program in place, and how has that been um, uh, utilized over the last year, and what's the plans for the future budget? Uh, and it's not my area of expertise. We do have a supplier diversity uh, program, and it is very important to the agency, and we will get back to you with, uh, you know, with figures. But um, I, I can at least brag about the transaction that I, <laughs> you know, that, that I had control of and had uh, 54%. It's something to brag about for sure. Um, my last question would be, uh, in the budget, uh, you talked about financing and um, increased financing possibly going forward. What percentage of, have you uh, allocated in your budget um, funds for uh, debt service and increased coverage numbers, and what would that look like? Uh, uh, yeah, yes, we have. We always monitor uh, our debt service debt service, and we look at different structures to see how it would impact us uh, uh, in the future. So we'll look at different scenarios. Uh, you know, our next, uh, we'll either close in we, some TIFIA loans in 2015, and we look at that scenario, and in 2016 we're looking at sales tax bonds. So we always run different scenarios. Just roughly how much was that in the budget? So, so you have a our bonds are paid out of two sources. You know, most of them are paid out of the capital program, right? We have Garvey bonds and, the, and those, and, and that's in our budget book. We can give you the details on the specific amounts that, that are paid out of there. Um, off the operating budget, we have the pension obligation bond, um, which is our roughly $2 billion bond that was issued several years ago for the pension funds, um, and that's roughly $156 million every year that we pay out of operating. Um, the TIFIA transaction that did close, um, the 95th Street station okay. transaction, that one is um, that one is the the debt service begins in 2019 and 2020 at the as as our bus lease um, expires. So we fit the debt service at the end of that, and we work with the federal government um, to make sure that that was a model that fit that fit with them. Okay. Yeah. So you. as the lease rolls off, then that's when the TIFIA rolls on. Yeah. Director Hobson. Hi. Uh, thank you very much. Um, two questions. One, the uh, app mentioned earlier by uh, Metra, is that, uh, I hope, it's the same app that you were talking about with the Ventra. So we've just heard about the same app from the two different agencies. That's wonderful to hear that that's just yes. one app. Uh, my other question is that, you know, we uh, look at the underemployment number. That number remains high, and that doesn't uh, help bus ridership. Uh, we look at the consumer fuel prices. Those are down. That doesn't help bus ridership. Uh, 2013, uh, bus ridership was down. 2014, bus ridership was down. So all, you have all these factors that are, you know, not in favor of increased bus ridership, mm -hmm. yet you forecast an increase in bus ridership for 2015. Um, I, I, how do you reconcile that? Yeah, so... Um, so we know that you know 2014 is lower than we had projected, but we had when we if you look back at our figures in 13, we had projected an increase in rail and a decrease in bus. Um, the magnitude is a little bit different, but system wide, um, it sort of fit, it fit with our with our expectations. Again, because of the some of the specific one-time impacts we see happening in 2014, um, you know we you know we assume project that for the most part some of those are going to go away, like the polar vortex or some of these other um, items. So we think that the bus ridership <laughs> is going to exactly. hopefully right knock on wood right <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Exactly. Um, yeah, <laughs> knock on wood that that goes away. And, and the bus ridership increase is very modest, four-tenths of one percent. So I'd say we're being relatively conservative even within that. All right. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, other questions? Uh, Director Colson. A uh, couple of questions. Uh, I noticed in your budget documents that the average CTA fare is $1.13. And it seems to me the public needs to be reminded of what an incredible bargain they're getting in the CTA. And the day will come, I'm sure, when you're going to have to raise your fares. And if you do, remind people that it's only $1.13 for, for a long time. That's remarkable. It is incredible. Um, nothing is going to kill your ridership faster than if the public perceives your system is unsafe. And so you talked a little bit about cameras. And you're spending, I think, $14 million on security for next year. Um, as cameras get smaller and cheaper, do you have cameras on every rail car? Or is that too much? Yes, we do. So, and that's why actually we have the ICE funding is actually to enhance that, so to add a few more cameras in, in, in the vehicles. But then also because now we have coverage within all the rail cars, 
that's a lot of video. So we want to, we need to be able to handle that video as it as it comes in. And so that's that's the whole project that we that we've applied for. And you ought to perhaps have signs reminding people that they're on candid camera because that would be a deterrent. <laughs> I don't see signage everywhere reminding people of that. We, and people would feel safer if they were reminded that there are cameras. I think. Um, there's a strange thing in our statute um, that says uh, that triggers your abil- the CTA's ability to get any money, and that requires the county to provide $5 million to the CTA every year. And I notice that's not in your budget, on, uh, at least the documents we have. I, I am told that that has been done, though. Is that right? Yeah. yeah uh, so we have – we're actually – we're required from – by our statute, and then it's also written in the RTA statute – to get five million dollars from two units of government within within the county, so and actually in our statute it requires Cook County to pay two million and the city of Chicago to pay three million, and we, we classify those as statutory required contributions um, in our budget document. So they're there. We've got the checks for this year, so so we've got them in this year. So okay, good. And uh, a lot of people that live in Lincoln Park are concerned about your uh, your proposed Belmont flyover, which I think you call the Ravenswood crossover or something. You know, the tracks go up north of Belmont and connect with the Brown Line. And there's a lot of people that think it's costly and it's going to be unsightly. I noticed there's nothing in the 2015 budget on that project. What is the status of that project? I mean, is it true that nothing in 2015 is going to be spent on that project? Yeah, so what we have, so what we have in the budget are the secured funds for the red-purple modernization program. So that's the $35 million that we got in core capacity, competitive core capacity funding. We're the first in the nation to get that, that level of funding, showing the federal commitment to the red-purple moder- modernization. Um, those funds, along with the local match that's required of them, um, are provided to continue the planning process and preliminary engineering for the project, and then all of the designs, all the alternatives, um, are considered as part of that planning process, the environmental impact, impact, the environmental assessment, all of that. So that is within our budget in the capital in the capital program. But it's not a, it's not a done deal either way. I mean, you're going to have to make a judgment call as to whether it's worth doing that at Belmont right, at some point. Right, because the funds we have now are for the planning process and for preliminary engineering. Okay, and um, another comment I'd like to make. I don't think your bus operators get enough credit to uh, to see that this this woman bus driver the other day maneuver this big articulated bus to Navy mm-hmm. Pier during rush hour was remarkable, <laughs> and I think they don't get enough credit. It's a hard job, and they do very very well. So, with that, that's all I have. Thank you very much, and we'll pass your sentiments about the bus operators on. <laughs> Chairman Dillard. Thank you, uh, Ryan. Tom. Thank you so much for your cooperation and just the great work that uh, you're, you're, you're doing at the CTA. I think it's, it's a wonderful thing, uh, not only for the ridership, but just for uh, all of us who live in the metropolitan Chicago area. Um, on ice, I just want to make sure that because you all are responsible for doing it, um, you know, ice projects are, are not allowed for the ongoing service I mean, they're, they're allowed for, you know, for planning and development, but um, just just be careful there. Um, and, um, you know, we just want to make sure we're, we're following our, our statutes and our laws. Um, I can't wait to show my wife, who lived next door to the Wilson Station for years. She was an urban pioneer, and I rode out of that Wilson Station um, overlooking oh, wow. my shoulder many, many, many times, <laughs> especially after dark. Although she always told me, you know, if you're afraid, there's a firehouse right here. So oh, yeah. you could always go to the f- fireman would always <laughs> gladly walk my wife home. Uh, if she, but uh, but that improvement is unbelievable, and my wife will literally flip when she sees the uh, the station improvement that's coming there. I don't know. Is is Tom Farmer still in the room? I don't know if Tom is here or not. Yeah. Um, Tom, look at their slide. With respect to, and it goes to my question, are your operating costs going to go down when you modernize your fleet? A 60% reduction in delays, just be, the way they have improved, um, you know, the, the L car or the, the L's fleet, um, including a 9% cost reduction in operations per mile. Um, those are stats you at Metro. Um, ought to use. I mean, we're all one system and we're all one brotherhood and sisterhood here, uh, but those stats from the CTA, I think, will really help your make your case with respect to, to what you're doing for, uh, you know, what you're doing at Metra. Um, I want to thank you, too. One thing you didn't mention today, and, and, and 
President Claypool had me over uh, for a press conference with respect to the fraud, fraudulent use of, of cards and ticketing. Um, first of all, it saves money, and it's a fairness issue for those riders who really pay the dollar thirteen cents per ride um, that uh, is a bargain on the CTA. But um, I very much appreciate what you're doing and the way you look at, at fraud, but it's fairness for your riders and um, the cooperation of, of President Claypool and all your staff is, is, is greatly, greatly appreciated. Last question, Lucas Museum. Obviously, been in the news a lot. Um, if if the Lucas Museum is is built on the site that is there, I could care less what it looks like. Mm-hmm. I do care what it looks like, but that's not an issue. If it's built on that site, um, what kinds? Of, I know you have some green line changes that are that are that are going on down there, but what will that entail for the CTA in terms of, of any additional capital needs? So, so we're we're always in discussions with the city, and the city's really taking the lead on the development of it and the, and the, and the access to it. You know, I think we know from our discussions with them, the location is transit friendly. So, I mean, it's near Metra and it's near CTA. So, and I think that that helped with the site selection. But we continue to be in dis- discussions with the overall infrastructure for what's needed for that site. And, and Chairman, if I can just jump in, there there is an actual. Um, working group across mm-hmm. multiple agencies. The city is the lead. Mm-hmm. RTA is part of it, along with all the mm-hmm. service boards and community groups, the museum campus um, mm-hmm. members as well. So there's an actual active plan being worked on to look at some short-term fixes and then some longer-term outlook as well. Yep. We can get you more as that develops too. Okay. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Other questions or comments? Director. These are more uh, operational questions, but uh, they do have a financial impact. Uh, how much of your uh, budget is uh, related to fuel consumption? Four uh, percent. Four percent? For fuel, yes. Uh, I, I notice there's a lot of buses out there with uh, uh, G, GNP, uh, GNC, uh, CNG, uh, uh, compressed natural gas, uh, or uh, hydro, uh, uh, hybrid uh, systems. Uh, what's the future planning for uh, increasing your uh, capacity in, in those systems? So, so we could always, with every vehicle purchase, we'll look at the, the right fuel system and the impact it has on, on the operating costs. I mean, as it, it wasn't mentioned in this presentation, but as you, as you may be aware of, we have two all-electric buses that are now on the streets that we're, test, that we're testing. So um, they're actually being tested more downtown, so you may run, run into those. So we're going to see how those perform. Um, the buses that we mentioned that we're purchasing, those are clean diesel, standard clean diesel buses. Uh, but we always look at it whenever we're making a vehicle purchase to look at those long-term costs. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, for, for those of us who don't have a smartphone and don't know what an app is, can I still take $2 out of my pocket and get on the CTA? <laughs> yes, you, yes, you can on the bus. I'm oh, sorry. Yes, you can on the bus, and for the, the train, you need, just need a venture card, yes, or, or a credit card. I have a credit card, but not a venture card. Okay. Thank you. Ron, the last questions I had uh, deal primarily with the changes that were made to the budget policy. Both you and Tom uh, spoke about that. Uh, ICE was certainly a major change, and uh, that uh, seems to be moving along okay. I mean, there's some uh, additional documents that may be needed to be signed right. due to the, as the chairman spoke about, the statutory requirements or ordinances that we have. So I think that that process is moving along pretty well. And you heard my question to Metro about the uh, need for a reserve fund or at least for a policy, and you are aware of the fact that now that we're kind of out of the business of of looking at that, we still want to have a policy that we understand either you're implementing or this board has to do. Uh, So you realize, of course, that we still want to follow up with the CTA on that. And I don't know if you have any comments you'd want to make about it today, but uh, because your operation has a massive uh, budget, (laughs) you'd have to deal with a problem like that. Well, well, I I would say two things. So I agree with Tom's comments on the potential credit line. We're we're in a uh, a really low interest rate environment, and and the quotes that I 
I've gotten were even lower. They were 20 to 25 basis points for, say, a $100 million dollar a credit line, and you know, bank, the banks are hungry for business, and and we're all good credit. So I think that's one option uh, that we you know, could look at. Um, we also have a damage reserve, which is uh, currently overfunded, which would provide us uh, some relief if you know if we had some type of event that would would uh, occur. Okay. The uh, pr- program that you have for your. Um warehousing of, of parts and so forth. Is that something that could apply uh, to Metro, for example? Would that be a service that, that they could look at using, or is Napa not involved in, in that type of a rail system? Do you have any thoughts on that? It, it seems to have worked quite well to bring your inventory from $100 million down to $50 million. Right. It, 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 it's an outsourcing inventory system, so it, it, would, it could work anywhere. So it, um, if, if Tom would like to... to to come over and understand, we can connect the you know connect Metro with Napa, and it can at least explore explore the possibility. But it it, it would work for uh, you know any uh, any agency. Uh, back, way back in the days of the Park District, we actually outsourced our our, our inventory, uh, and and so it it, it definitely it, it definitely can work. I guess uh, with that in mind, if nobody else has any other questions, oh, yes, Director Buchanan. Yeah, being a South Side resident for all my life over there, it, uh, what is the status of the extension <laughs> off of 95th Street? It would be nice to see the Bishop Ford. It would be nice to see 394. It would be nice to see the CTA go all the way to Will County down that corridor. What's the status? Think big. So uh, it's, we've been talking about the red line extension. We talk about uh, at our at our board meetings, and when we have funds now in our capital program to continue that planning process. Obviously, big project need need multiple parties to to participate. But we, we've we've got funds available specifically for the project to, to continue on the schedule um, that we need to have for that for that particular project. Yeah. Any other questions, Mr. Chairman? Yes, Director Hobson. Piggybacking on uh, what the chairman had mentioned about cooperation, uh, for example, in, in that case on the uh, inventory or outsourcing of inventory, is there any cooperation done in terms of fuel purchases among the different uh, agencies? I do realize there may be conflicts because of blends and things like that, but is there opportunity to uh, improve hedging or purchasing uh, by uh, combining all three uh, service boards? No, we have we have discussed it, and it's something that we should probably look at again uh, on our fuel because we're using you know we're using a blend of D one and D two, and we started purchasing for so we stopped hedging. We really purchased forward, you know, as you know, getting taken advantage of the you know of the lower you know lower prices because the prices have been just nose diving in the last last few months, but. Um, uh, I will speak with with uh, Terry, both Terry and and Tom, and we'll see if there's any you know potential for us to uh, work closer together on it. Thank you very much. No other questions. Uh, anyone on the phone uh, have any questions? If if not, uh, thank you very much, Ron and Tom. Thank you. All. Appreciate it. <clears throat> All right, and now we're going to have Terry Brennan and um, from Pace. Oh, excuse me, and Executive Director TJ Russ. Thank you very much uh, for being here today. Oh, his opening remarks, and he'll help me address the questions. Uh, good morning, Chairman Dillard, uh, Chairman McGallis, and the RTA directors. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to present our 2015 budget. Um, there's two main elements to PACE's budget. There's a suburban service budget. And then there's the regional ADA budget. We have two separate funds. 
And uh, what I'll be doing today is I'll just I'll run through each one of these with you. First, we'll take a look at our suburban services budget. Summary highlights, uh, we have a very positive outlook for 2015 on the budget. It's balanced. It meets the recovery ratio. There's no major fare increases, no service eliminations. In fact, there's service improvements built into the budget in 2014 that will be operating all year next year, and that will contribute to actual ridership growth in 2015. Uh, turning and looking at the numbers, uh, kind of taking a look at our 2014 experience, Everything's going quite well this year, uh, much better than we expected. Fairbox revenues are performing favorably to budget. Uh, there's a few uh, things going on there. One is with uh, regard to our Ventra income. Um, a few major things happened this year when we implemented Ventra. We eliminated or decommissioned our old mag stripe system, and riders converted to Ventra as a result. That resulted in an increased average revenue per rider for us. In addition, we renegotiated our fair revenue sharing agreements with the CTA. That gives us a more equitable allocation of revenue. And that also contributed to that increase in average revenue per rider. Uh, just a little fact, our, our increase in 2014 was $0.08 cents a trip for our bus riders. That's about the equivalent of a $0.20 cent fair increase after the dust settles. So we were able to increase our revenue by uh, $1.8 million from that, uh, from that. There was a few offsets to revenue. Overall, we project we'll finish about a half million favorable. On the expense side, we're running $7.8 million favorable to budget. As was mentioned in the other presentations, fuel is, fuel is down. We all know oil prices are down. Our fuel prices are down as well. Last week, we paid two seventy one a gallon for ultra-low sulfur diesel number two, which is what we use. So uh, fuel prices are trending low. It was an unforeseen uh, condition, uh, and our, our 2015 budget is predicated on three twenty one a gallon, so we may be right out of the box, we may be looking pretty good going into 2015. Um, our venture expenses were also favorable this year uh, in terms of the processing fees and uh, uh, the, the base uh, component fee. And also our new service program that we implemented in 2014 went in a little later uh, than originally planned by our service planners, and that resulted in some positive budget variance for the year. Uh, public funding, as you know, is running favorable for the year. So our bottom line uh, for the year of 2014, we should come in about uh, $8.7 million favorable for the year. Uh, taking a look at 2015, our budget projects 2.2% revenue growth, and that's coming largely from additional ridership that we project for next year, additional uh, vans in service in our van pool program, um, and so we're expecting continued growth in those programs. Our operating expense rises to $223 million. That's nearly an 8% increase, which is significant. Uh, there's some big pieces in there that, that are driving that growth. We have new initiatives in 2014 that will be operating all year in 2015, and that's a large component of it. We also have additional new service initiatives that are funded uh, via the ICE program that will be going in in 2015, and that's contributing to that growth. We have a few other items uh, that are growing slightly faster than inflation. Labor costs are going to grow faster. We have core inflation pegged at 2% for next year. Uh, labor costs will be growing around 3% uh, for next year. Our health insurance program will be growing at about 4.1% next year. So while it's uh, uh, fairly reasonable, it's still in excess of inflation. Uh, for 2015. So that's what's driving that, uh, that number for next year. The $162 million uh, operating deficit is balanced to the RTA funding mark. Uh, we appreciate the RTA's cooperation on developing the 2015 marks. It was, uh, it was a tough effort. Everybody pulled together and uh, we were able to uh, balance the budget. Uh, taking a look at uh, our ridership in a little bit further detail. Uh, Similar to uh, the CTA, we're experiencing some loss in ridership this year. Uh, we're pegging a lot of it on the, uh, the early months of the year, January and February, when we had a horrific weather, uh, winter conditions that really uh, decimated our ridership in those months. Uh, you can imagine you couldn't even stand on the street to catch a bus because of the snow piles that were out along many of our suburban arterials. Um, 
subsequent to that, uh, we've we've experienced some fall off in ridership with the with the elimination of the old magnetic stripe system. As I mentioned, we we had to do away with the cash transfer, um, really incenting people to move the Ventra. That probably cost us a little bit of ridership. We had to get rid of our ten right ticket. It probably cost us a little bit there too. So uh, those had a dampening effect on ridership in uh, in 2014. For 2015, as I mentioned earlier, we expect that the uh, service improvements that we put in this year and the ones that we have planned next year will drive our ridership growth. We expect to have more vans in service next year, and uh, that ridership will continue to move forward. One of the bright spots in our ridership uh, 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 horizon for 2014 was uh, our bus on shoulder program, which provides express service on I-55, the ridership on those routes is up 44% in 2014. It's a very popular service, and uh, it's it's kind of helped put a dent in uh, in the ridership numbers. Taking a look at our ADA paratransit budget for 2015, uh, same story. It's uh, it's a good it's a good budget. Everything's balanced, um, and we don't see any major issues for 2015. Some favorable news in 2014, we, we received an unexpected uh, increase in Medicaid reimbursements. Uh, there was a true up or reconciliation uh, for reimbursements for Medicare, uh, Medicaid, I'm sorry, eligible trips from 2009 to 2012, and it resulted in an additional $2.8 million uh, in, in 2014. Uh, for 2015, we're projecting ridership to grow 4.9%. And the RTA funding number for 2015 is expected to be adequate. Uh, taking a look at the ADA numbers, uh, for 2014, we're, as I mentioned, we'll be coming in favorable to budget. We project a $1.9 million favorable result. Those funds will remain with the RTA in the ADA fund. The ADA, as you know, is just funded on a uh, deficit basis. If there's a favorable result, it remains in the fund. Uh, those funds don't go to PACE. There's a slight over-budget condition in 14 on the ADA. It has to do with a upgrade to the trapeze technology system that we're using to run the ADA program. Uh, we're making some enhancements, and we're upgrading that system. And unfortunately, the ADA program does not have a source of capital funds. Uh, in terms of our current capital funding scheme in the region, uh, when the ADA was carved out, there was no... Uh, capital source targeted for the ADA. So that, that technology cost has to be charged to the operating budget. We figured this was a good year to do it since we have the additional revenue from the Medicaid reimbursements. For next year, revenue looks like it's declining, but it's really not. It's just that uh, blip of Medicaid reimbursements uh, burning off. Expenses are growing by 7%. The ADA is uh, pretty straightforward. Uh, you provide service when trips are demanded and we're projecting about a five percent increase in demand and that's a one for one increase in cost our contracted services expense the program is contracted the entire ADA program is privately contracted contractor costs that are fixed per these five-year agreements are projected to rise about three percent next year so that's driving the overall uh, program cost for next year taking a look at the ADA ridership in a little further detail we expect the city ADA to grow by 5% to 2.8 million trips. The taxi access program is sort of waning. Um, that's where individuals that are registered, certified for the ADA, can call and use a taxi. Uh, it's a city of Chicago program, and uh, its popularity has been declining. I don't have a particular reason for that. It may be Uber or some other options that uh, people are pursuing. Uh, the suburban ADA ridership is projected to grow by 5% as well, and the overall um, is at 4.9. Um, PACE, for those of you that are not familiar, we took over the uh, CTA's ADA paratransit program in 2006 um, and have substantially grown the program since. Um, our capital program for 2015 just kind of <laughs> puts it all on one slide. Um, as you can see, most of our money, 60% uh, will be going to rolling stock. Uh, we project to buy 75 fixed route buses next year at a cost of $32 million and 190 van pool vehicles. Those are the two big rolling stock projects for next year. And in terms of facilities, aside from a, uh, uh, a number of improvements to our garages, 
the big project in there is the I-90 corridor infrastructure. Uh, I'm sorry, I-90 corridor infrastructure is in for engineering at $1.1 million, but the big project is Milwaukee Avenue ART. We'll be building 18 stations between Jefferson Park and Golf Mill to support a, uh, a bus rapid transit type service on Milwaukee Avenue. Um, and that's programmed for $10.4 million for next year. Uh, Northwest Cook Garage Land, uh, this is more of a programming matter. We had these funds budgeted previously from PACE reserves. Uh, we're now switching that to PACE bond funds uh, that will be issued uh, in a subsequent year. Uh, and then lastly, replacing the garage security systems at $3.3 million. All of our garages are... Uh, security systems are out of date and need to be upgraded. Uh, lastly, on the Burr Ridge Park and Ride, uh, that parking lot supports the I-55 bus on shoulder service, and it's at capacity, and we can uh, double the capacity of the lot there for $1.165 million. Uh, just some uh, background on what we're doing with our capital money. Uh, we, we're going to be buying 91 compressed natural gas vehicles, in 2015. These vehicles will be assigned to our South Division in Markham. and bonds for four specific projects, $12 million uh, for this South CNG uh, conversion project. We'll be coming back with that to the RTA uh, for approval sometime in the first quarter of 15, perhaps February. And lastly, uh, just I know you're very familiar with the intense capital needs for the rail system and the backlog and the shortfall that exists for rail. Um, Pace also has a shortfall. Our 10-year capital need of $2.1 billion is less than a third funded based on currently identified sources. So we have a one point, almost a $1.6 billion capital shortfall for Pace, your smallest service board. Um, our capital shortfall, uh, somewhat different than rail and uh, shortfall, Ours tends to be in the fleet. Our biggest capital need is our fleet, and that's where our shortfall exists. Um, over this 10-year period, we have unfunded needs for 784 fixed route buses, over 1,000 paratransit buses, and nearly 1,400 van pull vans. Uh, without timely replacement, our maintenance costs are going to go up. Unlike rail, our vehicle maintenance costs are a major component. We don't have track right away and structure vehicle cost, driver maintenance uh, costs. So uh, we're, if we don't replace these vehicles, uh, we're going we're gonna to see costs rise rather than decline over this 10-year period. And that's essentially it. Um, I have TJ, TJ Ross is here, our executive director, and uh, we'd be glad to address any questions the board may have. Thank you, Terry, and uh, thank you for the presentation. Again, we'd like to request a copy of the slides. If we could have that, that would be great. Um, got oh, we got them. Okay, great. I guess we do. The um, policies that were changed for the budget, you've heard the discussion with the uh, two service boards before. We made a couple of major changes, which uh, came as a result of recommendations from the service boards to some extent. Uh, one dealt with certainly the ICE funding, and we've heard your presentation on that. And the other dealt with the reserve fund. Just two seconds of your thoughts on how you would approach a reserve fund 
Um, you've heard the discussion for right. CTA metrics. Right. We have a board policy for working cash that um, sets a minimum of one month, uh, about 8.5% uh, for a working cash reserve. So that's essentially it. Mm -hmm. uh, we're doing much better than that right now in terms of cash and also in terms of unrestricted net assets. But um, in terms of working cash, it's one month reserve. And if there's a calamity that um, hits the region, um, I think we'll all be talking about what we're going to do to get through it. So I, mm -hmm. I don't want to go there right now. But that's something that we can certainly look at. We want to have a plan in place that we think right. Would I work. think that's. I think that was a, a wise recommendation of the Government Finance Officers Association, and there's a lot of other governmental uh, bodies out there that that have spent a lot of time on this subject. And I think we could benefit from that research, um, particular to our type of operation and the type of risk that we're exposed to. Thank you. You, me you, you mentioned the uh, amount of capital needs you have and, and the budget that uh, you need for that. Um, you haven't raised fares since 2009, uh, both right. on right. PACE and, and for um, the ADA. Have you given any consideration to to and when you would might consider raising fares, and could you not follow something similar to what Metro is doing and allocate a, a portion of that toward the capital for bonding or whatever? We do uh, take a look at fares closely every year with our budget cycle and even off cycle. And when we were looking at it for 2015, uh, two things came uh, to mind. One was we did quite well on the Ventra implementation in terms of increasing our revenue without raising fares. Mm. We've also experienced a softness in the ridership this year because of the, the harsh weather and other conditions. And we know that when we raise fares, we lose riders. We have negative elasticity. We've lost riders on every fare increase that we've ever implemented. Uh, given the fact that our revenue is performing well, um, our ridership is looking like it could recover, we don't think that 2015 is a good time to adjust fares. We also took a look at a few other factors. Our average revenue per rider for the bus system is $0.92. Cents. It's the same as the CTAs. Um, the CTA is not raising fares in 2015, and we do have to maintain pace more than perhaps even Metra. We do have to maintain full integration with the CTA on fares. 50% of our riders transfer back and forth between the two systems. So it's, it's really important that our, our fares are um, fully integrated with the CTA. The other thing I uh, just would mention is that uh, Tom showed a great chart on how Metro fares have not kept pace with inflation. Uh, I don't know if you recall, but in 2007, the Auditor General uh, did a study of what our fare should be. It was, it was a great report. They found that our fares did keep pace with inflation. We subsequently increased fares in 2009, as you mentioned, and I just did a little quick update of the chart the OAG prepared, and we're less than five cents off from inflation going back to 92 when the OAG did their study. So we're right there. We're, right. we're trending well, well with inflation. It's not to say that we won't ever raise fares again. We just have to consider it very carefully. And the only last point on fares, uh, now that we have Ventra, we need to think more about market pricing rather than fares. You know, in the old days, you had to put a dollar in the fare box or whatever it was, and you didn't have the opportunity to uh, design a fare system that tries to grow ridership and takes advantage of market opportunities. This Ventra system has the technology, the flexibility to allow us to think about alternative pricing mechanisms that can increase ridership without and revenue without um, the negative impacts that past across the board type fare increases have had. Thank you. The uh, last question I have, I guess, is the ADA program. This board has been real supportive of ADA and your operating of that system for quite some time from paratransit needs. And in the budget, I notice you have like 10 additional positions. Can you tell us right. a little bit about what those positions are going to be doing and why such a large increase? I think you have 30 people now doing it. And what are we right. doing different in 2015? Well, part of it, uh, part of it is catch-up. 
um, there's there's been the same 35 people ass assigned to the ADA program since we took it over in 2006. And since that time, the ridership has grown by over 50 percent. The safety sensitive uh, positions that we monitor for our contractors have grown by 65 percent. There's 65 percent more vehicles out there in service than there were in 2006. We also had an 87 percent increase in incident reporting that we have to monitor and manage. Um, and there's additional requirements from the FTA on ADA reporting and monitoring. The, um, the FTA did a triennial audit of PACE and they did an in-depth drill down on the ADA program for compliance in 2014. And I'm I'm proud to report that we received an excellent no finding result for the entire triennial, which is uh, unusual for a transit agency. But in particular on ADA, they were very complimentary of the way we were managing the ADA and how we were maintaining compliance with all of the various regulations for drug, alcohol monitoring, vehicle condition, and reporting. That system, as it's grown, has put a tremendous burden on the existing staff. And the need to not only maintain compliance and, and do our jobs, uh, we've got a fiduciary responsibility for that program, uh, as well as make the kind of enhancements that we're, we're looking for launching in 2015 uh, with the trapeze upgrade. Um, those are going to require additional people. And, and uh, so what it boils down to is it's a little bit of catch-up. Uh, we want to make sure that our people aren't overtaxed, overstressed, working too much overtime, and we want to make sure that we're doing our job. So uh, it's basically it's catch-up and a little bit of new technology that's driving that increase. It's, a, it's an area that certainly is uh, one of the fastest-growing costs that we have. Uh, in a system from a percentage standpoint. It's, a, it's almost a victim of its own success because the cost grows as demand grows. And uh, the demand grows as we do a better job. And we've been doing a really good job. Uh, demand has been growing. Uh, the trend, you know, as, as the baby boomers age and, and more of them are unable to drive uh, looking forward, we're going to see further increases in demand. Uh, but you can rest assured we're doing everything we can to improve our productivity and maintain our cost. When you look at the RTA sub-regional peer report, our ADA service out outperforms all of the other major markets in terms of cost efficiency and effectiveness. We're, I think we're doing a great job. Uh, we're wrestling with this on a daily basis. The technology improvements that we make um, are all geared around reducing cost, improving the customer experience, and safety. One of the ways that, that you talked in the past about reducing costs was to try to transition people from that level of service onto the regular transit right. uh, the, system. The, what kind right. of success have you had in doing that? Because that reduces the cost considerably. You know, we've, we've made a lot of marketing efforts and promotional efforts and working with the communities and the workshops to, to get individuals that can use mainline service to do so. Uh, it's an uphill battle. Um, I think the next step um, that would probably go a long way toward accomplishing that will be trip screening, uh, where the caller, uh, the, the dispatcher actually taking the call, will be able to determine using the technology if that individual can take a fixed route or mm -hmm. rail trip mm -hmm. instead of the trip that they're calling to, to reserve. We have the okay. Thank we, you. And we can get you the figures on, on the okay. current transition. Right. Thanks. Uh, uh, Director Totten. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Terry, I see you've got in your capital program some money for I-90 corridor infrastructure. It's my understanding that that project is supposed to be complete in 2016. Uh, for January of 17, right. 17. Is, is start. What is, uh, what is going to be the impact on pace uh, on that uh, corridor change? Uh, equipment? Uh, right. Uh, ballpark, there's going to be about $8 million in additional service. They'll be starting in 2017. There'll be additional express buses running in the I-90 corridor. There will be additional local feeder and support services that bring people to the express service. From a capital standpoint, 
We're going to need 24 additional buses to run that service. And we're going to build three park and ride lots, uh, one at Randall Road, one at Route 25, and one at Barrington Road. We're working with the tollway now while that corridor is under construction to uh, preserve the parcels and, and do our engineering uh, so that pedestrians can access the parking lots. Um, so that, that project's uh, pretty well underway. It will have a significant impact. Uh, I don't have the ridership figure off the top of my head, but uh, we're expecting, similar to the success that we've experienced in the I-55 corridor, you know, when the bus doesn't have to sit in traffic and it can get a, a faster trip uh, to the CTA uh, blue line, uh, we, we expect that we're going to see some significant ridership boost in that corridor. Uh, some of the routes we currently have operating there, Route 606, 600, are doing quite well already. Those buses are packed, uh, and we think that we'll, we'll see further increase there. Where's the funding going to come well, from? Well, uh, it's, it's multiple sources. Uh, the operating is going to be funded out of our operating budget. We have that built into, turns out, into our three-year plan in the out years. The uh, capital funding is coming largely from CMAC. CMIC funding and some PACE funds. We use some of our own uh, what we call PBV or our reserve funds, positive, variant, positive budget variance funds that are then recycled into capital. Uh, to, that's what we're using actually right now to pay for the engineering work uh, for the three parking rights. Thank you. Yes, Director, Director Lewis. Uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you. Um, Terry, very excellent presentation. Just a couple of questions. Uh, one, you mentioned the need for new capital equipment. I wondered, are you using lease financing and other uh, creative uh, financing methods to help that? Because it sounds like you're purchasing the vehicles or plan to purchase the vehicles right. as opposed to a lease. Is that right. something you've looked at? We have looked at lease versus purchase. Unfortunately, the way the FTA rules are for 5307 funds, the only way that you can do a lease with federal funds is to prove that the lease is less expensive than a purchase. And because of the interest expense on a lease, it's an impossible argument to make. And that's why most transit systems are not able to lease their vehicles with federal funds. So when you look to leasing, you'd have to look to other sources of funds. And we really don't have a large source of other funding other than our federal funds for vehicles. Uh, a f years ago when it was allowed, we did a sale leaseback transaction uh, like the CTA Metro did with their rolling stock, but those have been prohibited as well. So we're kind of in the, in the boat of just having to use our federal 5307 formula funding to, to buy the vehicles outright. I understand. Thank you. Uh, Ron talked about um, an interesting program at the CTA relative to outsourcing. Is that something that PACE could also consider? We've, uh, we've looked at it, and perhaps we need to look at it again, but um, the cost-benefit analysis, the kinds of numbers that we were getting, uh, indicated that it wouldn't be financially advantageous to us. Uh, some of it has to do with logistics. We've got uh, 10 garages spread around the region from Joliet up to Waukegan, and to uh, deliver parts uh, and maintain that inventory would be difficult. Uh, some of the other some of the other factors we maintain a very low inventory already, uh, and we monitor. Our, we only have a six million dollar parts inventory, and we we monitor it closely for turns. Um, we can look at it again. Uh, we do have uh, plans uh, for the future to build a centralized sort of warehouse facility and look to see if we could um, reduce the cost of our inventory at those uh, locations. Um, and we could work it into that analysis to see if there's any uh, financial benefit. Okay. Thank you. My final question, uh, one you know was coming, uh, was do you have a minority supplier diversity program in place and how effective has that been working for you? Uh, we do, and then we're making additional efforts. Uh, there's a disparity study that we're under taking right now. We expect to have that in the first quarter of next year that will identify where additional opportunities will be for us. We assign DBE goals to uh, almost, now I wouldn't say every procurement, but most of our procurements, particularly in the construction area, where we've been very successful at achieving 20, 25 percent DBE participation. So uh, it's, it's I'm, I'm maybe not the right person to speak to all of the activities that are going on with EV, but I know from my I oversee procurement 
and I, and I see what we're assigning to our procurements. And nearly all of our procurements have some sort of DBE participation, particularly the construction. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, other, yes, uh, Director DeWitt. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I'm intrigued by the uh, right on shoulder program. I think a 40% increase in ridership on I-55 is indicative of uh, the success of the program, and I'm thrilled that 90 is moving forward. Can you talk a little bit about uh, long-range planning with regards to any additional routes that you're looking at? I-88 on the horizon somewhere. Let me give this one to TJ. Sure. Okay. The, um, the IDOT is doing most of the work. And I know that uh, they're finishing up some preliminary engineering for the uh, Edens. That, that one they're finishing up. Uh, they are also looking at other ones as well. We have the potential of about 230 miles of expressway corridors, and we're, we've got those on our plans. There's 10 different corridors and about 230 miles, so we have that on our plans. Yeah, the ridership increase in 2014 was 44 percent, but when we since tw October of 2011, when we started this, it's gone up three times. Wow. It's basically gone from uh, 400, a little under 400 riders a day to a little over 1,200 riders a day. And that was a service that sat out there for a long, long time. And i just make one more comment. It took almost 14 years from the time that Rick Batraglupo and I those of you who know him, and I went to Minneapolis and saw what they were doing there, and they have over 200 miles of bus on shoulders uh, until the implementation in 2011. So it's, it's, uh, it's been a long project. It's one that, uh, that we just had to keep beating at, and now we're in a good position. So, Great. yes, it, uh, we're, I'm getting a lot of pressure from my board for more. Great. Thank you. Director Frega. I'd like to, co uh, to uh, compliment uh, Pace on uh, the fossil fuel conservation modes that you've taken. Uh, and uh, I hope you keep uh, pushing these conservation uh, methods uh, on, uh, for the future. I have uh, a couple of questions, and one is Pace is, is progressing very well on that. How are you doing with your ADA with uh, the uh, contractors? Uh, are you uh, insisting that they have some uh, conservation type uh, systems in there, like uh, 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 compressed uh, natural gas or, or uh, hy hy hyd uh, hybrid systems in their, uh, in their vehicles? That, that is not currently part of any contract that we have with the private providers where we're requiring them to use alternative fuel vehicles. Uh, and, and, we're, and you're right. We need to take a look at that. I think that uh, there's some real possibilities. You're seeing fleets. Those of us who remember this, you're, you're going to see fle fleets going back to propane. We all know that in the 50s, most of the fleets ran on propane. Uh, and that technology has come a long way. So there's a possibility of propane. Uh, the hybrid vehicles, we had a set of them that the state bought for us, and uh, unfortunately that design did not work. Those vehicles uh, uh, did uh, failed. So the next question is, are there other hybrid vehicles in that size range? And we don't see that just yet. Compressed natural gas is a possibility, but I think for the smaller garages, the propane might be uh, might be something that really can work. And if that's something that this board is interested in, uh, I know that my board would be interested in, so we'll, we'll take a look at that. Uh, another question is uh, your, uh, your RFPs. The state has a 3% set aside for veteran-owned firms. Have you in, in, uh, in your... Uh, RFPs uh, required any of that? No. Is there is there any reason that you haven't, or is it uh, going to be in fact? Uh, are you going to put it in effect in the future? I think it's being evaluated as part of this diversity analysis that's ongoing now. Uh, we don't have a clear position on that one yet. Thank you. Yes, Director Melvin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, 
over the past few years, I've gotten to watch you guys and meet you guys and look at your monthly numbers. You guys are good operators and uh, very nimble and very responsive. And Thank you. Congratulations Thank and, you. and very, very nice presentation. Um, uh, to follow up on uh, uh, Director Frager's question about the, um, the compressed natural gas, so uh, are those vehicles a good value? They're about the same price as the diesel vehicles. Okay. They're, it's, you know, we were looking at them, they're $479,000 a copy on that bid for the 91 vehicles that we're buying. That's about the same price we were paying for traditional diesel vehicles. That's good to know. Uh, and the, the fuel savings, well, it will be significant. Uh, we expect that our south division garage will probably save about $2 million a year in fuel uh, based on current prices. So That's great. Uh, it's about a two-third reduction in fuel. Um, the other big CNG project we have in the works uh, is we have plans to build a new Northwest Cook garage to replace our facility in Des Plaines. And when we build that facility, uh, that will be a CNG facility right out of the box with the CNG fleet as well. So um, that will move a large percentage of our fleet to CNG. That's great. And one other question about uh, as, as the oil prices have gone down, you mentioned that uh, there's a chance to have some savings there. Any thoughts about yes. locking something in for the year, or are you just going to continue to be opportunistic? Or, or? Um, uh, anyone that knows me uh, knows that I don't like to lock fuel. Um, our experience has been that the way we buy fuel currently, we, we bid forward uh, quarterly, and we float with the market based on OPUS. And when we compare our fuel pricing results over time, we, we beat everybody. So what I've learned from that is that you can't outfox the market. Um, and also, there's some, there's some research out there. Uh, uh, with the Transportation Cooperative Research Program, the TCRP, they did an analysis of 10 transit agencies and their fuel hedging experience. Nine of them lost significant amounts of money on their fuel hedging program. So I, I've kind of learned the lesson from other people's mistakes that um, hedging's not for us. Uh, we're not that sophisticated. Um, and floating with the market is actually very easy to explain to people. What's hard to explain to people is why you're paying $3 a gallon when fuel's selling at the pump for $2 a gallon. Right. <laughs> That's a non-starter. Um, so it's, it's best to, in our experience, and based on the, the small amounts relatively uh, of fuel that we buy, to, to flow with the market. And we pay a very tight margin. Uh, our margins over Opus tend to be in the fractions of a cent which covers the contractor's profit and delivery. So uh, it's a very tight margin. We, last week, uh, our price was 271 a gallon. So, um, and, and any money we save on fuel goes into our reserve, and we use it for capital. So it's, a, it's a sort of a win-win. That's great. Well, thank you. Thank you. Keep up the good work. Yeah. Other questions? Director Hobson. Yeah. Um, both Metra and CTA have talked about declining fuel prices, and you yourself talked about declining fuel prices. But in the report that we have, it says PACE forecasts $3.17 in 2014 and $3.21 in 2015, a rising fuel price. Right. Seems counterintuitive to me. Well, uh, because of this protracted budget process that we go through, our budget essentially was put together last summer. And when it was put together, that was the fuel outlook. Uh, this recent sort of implosion in oil prices and fuel prices was not anticipated. Um, so the situation we're in now, yeah, we're going to we're we're favorable to budget, and we're going to be favorable to next year's budget if fuel prices stay down. Um, and that's just the way it is. At the time you do a budget, you got to use your best information, your best uh, forecast. Uh, we rely on EIA and and other uh, futures market pricing in order to determine what our budget should be. I think, I'm not sure, I don't want to speak for Tom, but I think he was at 320-something a gallon as well for next year. Um, and I understand the CTA is maybe at $3 a gallon based on their lock. Um, but it's, it's a budget number, it's a plan number, it's not the actual, the actual will come in where it comes in. Hopefully it'll come in favorable. So you don't forecast any substantive changes to your budget for 2015 based on that? Not on that. Um, not, not at this time. What, what percentage of your total spend is fuel? Approximately 10 percent. 10 percent. Okay, thank you. I got it. <laughs> Director Colson. Yeah, Pace, you've shown a remarkable ability to keep your head down while everybody's taking shots at CTA and uh, Metra, so you're doing something right. 
But uh, you mentioned that one bus costs f about four hundred and fifty thousand dollars. Is that right? Four seventy. Four hundred seventy. Have you d have you discussed any uh, joint purchasing with CTA, or are there different kinds of buses, or is that a problem? They tend to be different vehicles. Um, the CTA has its own unique specification uh, for transit coaches. Um, it, there's some significant differences, and uh, based on timing and contract length and federal restrictions, um, it, it's been very difficult to sync up and do a joint procurement uh, for transit coaches. The spec aside, uh, there's other complications that make that difficult. We're currently under a, um, we are currently under a five-year contract with Eldorado National out of California for transit coaches, and we also awarded a five-year contract for CNG vehicles. We have five years for diesel and five years, so, so we're kind of locked in right now um, on our coaches. Other questions or comments? Yes, uh, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, your chairman, Rick Kwasniewski, um, and this is something that we need to pursue once the new administration in Springfield is in place and the human service director, whoever that is, has a chance to breathe. Um, but we want to explore every possible option, and, and we always focus on pools of transit money. But for ADA, um, we want to explore every possibility in human service budgets right. that we may not have looked at yet. Uh, and a lot will be in conjunction with, uh, and we'll, we'll put our, our RTA uh, lobbyist uh, in, in Washington uh, to work on this one as well. But, uh, you know, you, you, you've got ADA issues, you, you do get some Medicaid money, any dollar we can get from a source thinking outside of the transportation pool that we can get from human service budgets uh, allows you to use whatever we can supplant with that uh, for operations. And right. we That's just want to think out of the box that we're not missing something in, in terms of human service budgets just because we're all transit-oriented. We need to look at human services, uh, especially for your, your ADA. We think that's fertile ground. Uh, and we've also, I mean, one of the reasons why we pursued the Medicaid funding, um, and now we get about 1.5 a year on Medicaid, though we understand there may be some changes through the, the Health Care Act that may impact that money. Uh, but we think that's fertile ground. The other, the other thing that really would help ADA uh, operating costs would be is if we could get an ADA capital source. You know, if the contractors didn't have to buy all their buses and pay for their garage facilities out of operating, uh, and we could do that, uh, that would bring down that operating cost uh, per trip significantly. Yeah, I just think it's something. As after the first of the year, we need to, uh, you know, we need to give guidance to well, Governor-elect Rauner's administration and. You know, and see what we can do thinking outside of the box with, with our, you know, we've got a great congressional delegation. Uh, they work in a bipartisan fashion, and, um, you know, we ought to, we ought to see if, if they can scour, and they've got some tremendously brilliant staff people. Uh, I just want to make sure we're not leaving any money on the table. That's a great idea. Great. Other questions or comments? Just yes. a real I have to Do belabor this discussion. Uh, just a general comment. You know, one of the recurring themes here this morning has been um, joint acquisition opportunities. Everybody's talked about fuel, and I'm sure there are probably a thousand different items that each of these three service agencies are, are purchasing on a regular basis. I recall one of the infamous white papers that former Chairman Gates had put out talked about. Um, the importance of finding opportunities to 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 merge uh, purchasing ability. Uh, I, I think this is a good opportunity to take another hard look at that, and and a great opportunity for RTA. I think to take the lead on really driving that process for all of these service boards. Um, Director, uh, one mention on that subject, if I may, uh, not to give you the impression that there is no joint cooperative action I'm taking place. I'm not suggesting place. that. Yeah. Pace, and I know uh, Metro and CTA, we heavily use uh, GSA schedules for our procurements, uh, the federal government schedules. We also use the state of Illinois uh, procurement schedules um, for a number of procurements. So it, maybe it's not between the three of us, but it is joint government procurement that all three agencies do take advantage of. Sure. The subject uh, today, well, fuel, fuel, uh, fuel purchases. It, it seems like all three agencies kind of use a little different model in, in determining true. their needs. That's true. Um, you know, millions of dollars uh, spent on the purchase of fuel. That would be just 
one one item that would be a great place to start. I just uh, to point out the Ventra system is a joint purchase. It, it's one that all right. all three yeah, agencies sure. have, have uh, participated in. So it, I think it's a real good example, and it's one that is uh, I think we're pretty happy with. Sure. So we can build on that. We absolutely. And one thing I might suggest that we should do for the board is maybe sort of refresh a, a summary document that gives you kind of a look at some of the stuff that has been done either between ourselves or with other entities. You know, we even at RTA do a lot on um, computer purchases and things like that. Most of, much of our internal sort of operating capital stuff is often purchased off those uh, state or federal register stuff as well. So we should actually refresh that, give you a sense on where those opportunities have already been achieved and uh, give you some examples of other areas we can continue to pursue. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Any other questions or comments? Anybody on the phone have any questions or comments? If not, uh, certainly, Terry, I want to thank you for the presentation. And TJ, uh, Pace has always done a great job, and, and we appreciate you being here today. Uh, if there are no other questions or comments for the meeting, uh, make a motion to adjourn. Motion by Director Buchanan, second by... Okay, Director Melvin.